everybody, Patrick Hunter here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. Boxing history on the menu. As you can see, I'm here with my dude, Eris Pina, who is a copy box operator, but far more importantly, history guy like myself. We're here to talk about the Hall of Fame ballot like a handful of others have recently. Eris, what is up, bro? Everything is good, bro. Not too bad. Uh, I got my ballot in yesterday. It is indeed that time of the year where we start making votes and debate about who should get in, who shouldn't be in, why are some people still on the ballot, why people are not on the ballot still. Uh, a lot to unravel. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm uh, I'm going to warn some people in advance. I'll take the brunt of it. I don't care. It's cool with me, but I'm probably not going to be super nice to not necessarily the fighters, like not – I got nothing against the fighters. It's actually just the institution that I'm not super happy about for a handful of reasons. I have not gotten my ballot, but that's like the norm. Some I the last few years haven't even gotten a ballot and I've had to actually call the Hall of Fame facility and be like, can you physically send me a ballot like directly because I haven't gotten that shit and it's like October 21st or some shit, you know? That's happened the last two years and a handful of years before then. They don't even send it to my house. They send it to my old house that I'm not even in the same state. So I haven't gotten mine yet, but needless to say, I've, I've seen the ballot. I know who's on the ballot. Pretty good idea of how I'm going to vote, but we're going to run down that today, just like we have every year. Dude, I, I've voted. This is like my seventh or eighth year voting in a row. You're a fucking, you're about to get a gold watch. <laughs> He's <laughs> like a fucking 20-year yeah, right. veteran, bro. 20 years. Yeah, yeah. This year marks 20 years. The first time I ever voted was um, 2004 for the class of 2005. So that year on that ballot, from what I remember. So it was a lot different back then. You know what I mean? The ballots now is completely... completely Dude, you look different. like you're 20 years old. So that's not... People are watching this going like, what? Yeah, bro. I'm actually... It's, it's fucking crazy. I'm turning 40 in like a week. Literally just in a week, but um bless those Cape Verdean jeans, bro. Yes, sir. <laughs> but we um you know, the ballot back then was just like totally different. So like the modern category was anybody, I think, well that retired um after nineteen forty five, I wanna say. Nineteen forty five was the cutoff. And then anyone after that was on the modern ballot back then. So back then, and you had more votes too. Yeah, yeah, you had, you got to vote for ten guys as opposed to the five now. So back then, you would see names like, for instance, it's a bigger Renio. list too. Yeah, much bigger list. It was pretty massive. But you would have guys like Seferino Garcia, Lloyd Marshall, Holman Williams, alongside more modern guys like, um, the ones who got in that year: Terry Norris, Barry McGuigan, yeah, and um, Bobby Chacon. You know what I mean? So that's it was like an interesting dynamic, but it needed to be changed because like as Lee Groves and others had mentioned a long time, like it's a lot of those guys sitting on that modern ballot were never gonna get a chance to get in or you know, it was getting so log jammed that you're gonna have to move them eventually and do something. So after a number of years, I forgot the exact year they um they instituted it. I don't know if at that point you were voting yet or not, but they decided to um change it up where the old timers would now become more modern old timers, if that makes sense, right? So you would have guys from like anything from, I guess, up until 1988 or something like that. Like I forgot the exact year, the starting year, but it's like more modern guys up until yeah. 88. And then that you was have like a either the first year I voted or the year before I voted. I can't remember, but that's yeah. the only way. I, yeah, that's the only yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. And the other ones is like the pioneering, like the pioneering old timers were like, you know, you got the guys from like the 20s and 30s, things of that nature. You know what I mean? So, and they alternate each year in terms of which ones you can vote for. The modern ballot always stays the modern ballot, but they always kind of alternate the old timers each year of what you can vote for. And like the more modern ones are the old time, old time. But regardless, that's, that's how it's always been. But each year now, you know, there's always been like, since it opened up more names to be inducted, to, to, to be placed on the modern ballot, since, you know, removing a lot of those guys and putting them into another category, it opens up for more guys being on this ballot. And that's where the questions and, you know, the eyebrow raises come in now over the years, because there's been a lot of questionable guys that end up making it on the ballot, you know, in, instead of others who absolutely deservedly so. You know, and there's been like some, I, there's been some head scratchers over the years of why certain guys took so fucking long to get on. And I'll give you two, for example, 
um, Danny Little Red Lopez. For whatever reason, I mean, you know, Danny Lopez, his last fight was what, 1992 or something like that? Like when he made that ill-advised comeback. So, you know, the Hall of Fame, I think their, back then, their, um, their ruling was you had to be retired for five years. And yeah. then you would be eligible to be on the ballot. So, so he would have been eligible by 1997. All right. For whatever reason, hey, you know, think about his career too. At all action fighter, very popular champion, a good champion that, you know, stands up the test of time, whatever. And considering you see other guys who have gone in and stuff like that, definitely worthy credentials. It took forever for him to get on the ballot. Don't ask me why, but it just did for years and years and years until finally he was placed on. And when he did, he got in immediately. Um, Lupe Pintor was another one that took forever and a day to get on the ballot and like Julian Jackson, you know, and a few others, but like, so what I'm getting that is that like, you know, there's been just like a lot of guys that have been added. And when you look at them and you just kind of like, you know, and then you think of others and you're like, okay, why are they not on? That's just makes for the complex discussion. Yeah. It's, it's kind of weird. Um, the way that the things have changed, but I mean, you know, Basically, I mean the the takeaway overall for me is like I don't know what the fuck we're, they're doing with this institution at this point um, for a number of reasons, and I guess I won't go too much into like the personal type of shit, but like for me, you know the number one there are a number of voters, and I'm I'm not interested in like singling people out or being cruel or anything like that because it's not their fault that they've, you know, uh, been handed this responsibility. Uh, I mean, it's not their fault. It's just that, you know, the, the way that the boxing writers association has just kind of automatically given people a vote, um, is probably not the way to go considering the boxing writers association has really loosened the fucking requirements or if not the requirements, just the, what they consider, as far as getting in and you know so in any case needless to say there are a lot of people voting who just don't know shit from fucking shinola bro and they don't know who a lot of these fighters are yeah and on top of not and it's okay to not know but there's a difference between not knowing and just not really giving a shit and not knowing and going i'm gonna find out and most people aren't going to find out and don't care to. And so it's a little bit dumb and it winds up turning into a popularity contest. And then on top of that, when you couple it with the rule changes, it becomes obviously skewed the voting that is and the end who gets put on the ballot becomes skewed toward trying to attract fighters from recent years and more active fighters and shit to the actual hall of fame fucking facility on induction week and stuff like that, which as we can see in the last few years, also uh, the pandemic had a lot to do with it as well, but that's not only it because now a lot of people, if not the vast majority of people simply believe the pandemic's over. So I don't know if that has anything to fucking do with it at all at this point, but the last few years uh, at Canastota have been weak, really weak. We talked about it on the show how you know how it was this past June and it was it was just you know the the weird in, in terms of just everything man it was just different any time like completely different than anything I've ever experienced there it just was the energy was just completely off I mean you still have boxing fans they were enjoying themselves and you know the camaraderie of that or whatever but like in terms of just right the energy what the Hall of Fame used to be it's gone because they've cut out a lot like not the beer off course of what we're going to be talking about but like they've cut off so yeah, many no I was going to say that so please do yeah yeah. And it's like absurd, you know, when you really think about it. Like they used to have a cocktail reception that um that they would that was only an hour, you know what I mean? That was like held at this church or what uh, at this, you know, venue downtown. Like a hall and, or some shit. Yeah. Yeah, a hall, stuff like that. And it was a great thing time to be at, bro. Like I can't I can't tell you how much fun we used to have at those. It would only last like an hour and a half, but you were like elbow to elbow, literally bumping in the fighters as much as you were bumping in the fans while you were getting served free drinks and like, you know, finger foods and bullshit like that. And it was just a really good time, you know, and then you went from there and some people went to the dinner and other people just ran back to Graziano's and everything. But we all just, you know, it was just a lot of fun. So that got cut out. You had um, the celebrity golf tournament where if you signed up, you can be there playing golf on the same field and shit with, you know, all these former fighters, which you always were, you know, and they had like a barbecue and free beer and all this other stuff. Like that was a cool event. 
they had the um uh a 5k race yep. same thing you know who wants who would who, who wouldn't want to do road work with your favorite fighter do shit like that. so many different things that have been completely cut out and you know they still have the fight night and they still have their dinner but that's essentially it you know in the card show that's yeah it. Everything and, the, and i saw photos of dinner. the card show and i saw photos of what the card show used to look like yes yeah. and i'm like dude Ooh. because not it's as you know, because I've I've shown you and I've like taken a couple photos on social media and shit. I've sure. gotten a shitload of magazines lately for you know I'm, I'm like archiving and blah 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 as you know. But I've gone through a number of the fucking '90s magazines, uh, Ring, Boxing Illustrated, you know, a number of different magazines, and there uh, a handful of issues have a bunch of photos of the events of the shit that they were doing in the 90s and even the early 2000s actually it went well into the 2000s so it's not like yeah. and even the 2010s bro yeah i don't want to it went for a while it's just that the last handful of years especially but the shit that they had going on you know a whole bunch of events a whole bunch of little extra fuck it was almost like they had little overflow events because they had so many people and so much they shit did. going on yeah. it was like it was like overwhelming to the fucking town almost you know what i mean and the last few they years, for those few for those few days, you know, it worked for them. So I know there's like issues with like the Oneida Indian Nation out there. I know they took over Graziano's, and eventually they sh shuttered it and completely closed it down, which definitely took a hit for the Hall of Fame because Graziano's was just as important to the Hall of Fame as just being there and visiting fighters. You know, it was everything that went on at that place afterwards is what made it. But that got taken out. Um, the fact that they don't do the Hall of Fame ceremony anymore at the actual Hall of Fame. Like when the people get inducted, now they do it at the fucking Turning Stone Casino. Why? You know, like things like that. It just it doesn't make any sense. So and and again, like it, it's I know that there's a number of different factors here. I know the pan they took a really big financial hit during the pandemic, and I get sure. that. But it's not. It's kind of absurd, dude. You know what I mean? Like it's uh, if you need to like regroup or something like that, I get it. But to just kind of like hold these fairly limp uh, induction ceremonies and shit like that is is not helpful. Nobody really seems to be having the same kind of good time and stuff like that. And whatever. Anyway, I don't want to go on and on and on about how the the process is stupid and all that type of shit. But it also kind of bleeds into what we're talking about with the with the ballot today. With yeah. the fact that, like, we're going to see some stuff on the ballot that, like, I, I'm kind of just going to squint my eyes and be like, nah, man, you know, like, that that's not, I don't know how, why this person's there or, like, you know, what happened here. So, anyway, um, it's kind of an, I will say it's an interesting ballot. Yes. But there are a whole bunch of fighters on the ballot. I'm pointing to my screen. I don't have mine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are a whole bunch of fighters on the ballot that have ar really good arguments for being on the ballot and a number of them that have really good arguments for getting some sort of vote because it's like there's a it's not really top heavy this year. It's more like middle heavy. It's like sure. there's a whole bunch of fighters where I'm like, yeah, I could see that. I could see them getting in and there's an argument, but there's going to be a handful of fighters where we already know just because of like their notoriety and because they're, again, more recent names. That's probably who's going to get it. Sure. I mean, like right off the jump, Manny Pacquiao is um is yeah eligible. obvious shoe in yeah obviously shoe in and he's gonna be like an absolute one hundred percent with every voter imaginable because of just who he is and deservedly so. I mean, you know, we don't. There might be a few fucking haters. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be surprised, but I'd be shocked if someone didn't vote for him because, like, even if you don't like him, that's there'll like, be bro. Yeah. But they're even like Dan Raphael and a handful of others are trying to say they weren't going to vote for so and so the first time. Oh, yeah, the steroids, yeah, yeah. and it's like James I could see somebody example. saying some shit like that. But mm -hmm. but if they're being honest with themselves and not a total craphead, they're going to vote for Manny Pacquiao. Thousand percent. And so like Pacquiao, so the new guys that have been uh, that are freshly on the ballot for the first time is Pacquiao, Mikey Garcia, um, Sean Porter, and Lucian Butte. So. You know, besides Pacquiao, an automatic shoe win. Porter and Garcia. Well, Garcia, I can, you know, I, I understand how he gets on the ballot too. He was a four division champion, but you know, as loosely thrown around as that is today, he did have some good names on his resume and had a very solid career before he pettered out near the end when he clearly was like disinterested with the sport. 
But like, you know, especially his lower weight class work when, you know, he beat Salido and he beat Wama when both were still, you know, both were serviceable and um, generally dominated the divisions he was in back then. And then when he moved up and like Rona was still like a good fighter and, you know, he beat him and then he moved back down and beat Easter and stuff like that. Like I can see him getting a lot of votes where he probably would get in on his first time. I'm not sure if I'm going to vote for him, but like I, I wouldn't be surprised. You know what I mean? Now, for the other two, though, when it comes to a guy like Sean Porter and especially Lucian Butte, it's kind of like, eh, like, why? You know, Porter was a fun fighter. Don't get me wrong. Like, he fought everybody. He was the one dude from the PVC era that was willingly, openly to fight anyone and didn't give a shit, as opposed to all those other dudes who was always posturing and posing and yada, yada, yada. Not like, now, not yet. Sure. Work up to yeah. it. Absolutely. Yeah. But, like, you know, you got to give Porter credit for that. He fought Thurman. He fought um, uh, Spence. He fought Danny Garcia. He fought Broner. Fought Ugas. Um, I miss Crawford. You know, like, and then Kelbrook. Yeah, Kelbrook. Like, these are a lot of good dudes he fought. And but the problem is with him is that even though he fought all these guys, the majority of the time he came up short. He yeah, was competitive. Lost in almost major, all of his big fights. He lost all of them. Yeah, you know, like when you want to think about it, what was his biggest win? Um. Like, I don't know. I want to beat Broner. Like, um, Paul, not definitely not Polly, but I mean, like, you know, that's. Well, so, I mean, yeah. we're here to talk about this shit. Let's break this shit down. Let's let's take a little yeah, yeah, whoopsie yeah. poo here, bro. I mean, all right. Like, like you said, his losses, they're understandable losses and they're not the kind of losses where you're like, wow, he looks like shit. Kel Brook, Keith Thurman, Errol Spence, Terrence Crawford, those are all very good fighters and some of the better fighters of his sure. time or whatever. Uh, I mean, his win over Danny Garcia, there are a lot of people who are trying to argue, bro, Danny, <laughs> a couple weekends. Like Danny Garcia should be on the ballot. Bro, I'm not, I'm not arguing that. However, I'm, I'm not arguing that. But a couple weeks ago, right, right before he fought, motherfuckers were talking about, oh, if he can get the win this weekend, this is going to decide whether or not he's a Hall of Fame fighter. And I'm like, oh, what geez. the fuck are you talking oh, about? Man, no, I'm not, not I'm not making that up. I'm not saying it. Other people were saying it. I think that it's hilarious. But if you're trying to make that argument, then I guess I understand how you got to back yourself into a corner staying consistent that I guess Sean Porter deserves the Hall of Fame. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're going to constantly talk yourself into it, like, I get it. But yeah, I mean, that's probably his biggest win, Birdo, I guess. But that's 2017 Birdo, you know, <laughs> like, so I don't know. I he doesn't, that yeah, he really it's... does not have a whole bunch of really good wins, dude. No, and I don't think he should, you know, and especially for a first ballot, like if he got in on the first ballot, I would actually be pretty annoyed with that because that would just show, in my opinion, like you talked about earlier with um, the people that lack of education. Yeah. yeah it's just kind of going with the popular names of your time and who you were a fan of and stuff. And I know there's going to be people out there that will vote for Porter. Like they're fans of him. And I get it. He's a good guy and he stood relevant. Yeah, not and personal he, at he, all. Yeah. And he's stood relevant after retiring by being a good analyst now on TV seemingly everywhere. But like, again, it's just his career. When I look at a person who's in the hall of fame, his career doesn't stack up enough for me to be able to vote for him. And, you know, especially when I look at other guys on the list who I've voted for faithfully every single year, who we'll get into later on, but it's like, how can I vote for this guy when these guys deservedly have been on this ballot for a long time and have much more, um, you know, superior credentials when it go head to head with resumes? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I don't, it's, I don't really see the justification for putting Sean Porter on especially over some other fighters who really should be on the ballot and are not like yeah. that doesn't you know you, like the fighter that you brought up uh was it yesterday the day before sumbu kalambe you know i mean i'm on the shirt today <laughs> yeah it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in my opinion mikey garcia yeah i mean i think that if you're looking at the you're basically looking at the bulk of his career for the lower you know divisions uh and which is really good work hall of fame work yeah kind of arguable but once once he, he got to a point in his career where it was like well he was a fighter who was just like jumping weight classes looking for titles mm -hmm. it gets far less impressive at that point that and saying. then on top of that there's the last point of he's a fucking cop he <laughs> fucking quit to be a cop that fucking guy uh 
I remember, so, like, his first fight was on what? Uh, his first HBO fight was against that dude, uh, Matt Remillard, I think. I'm looking at his record now. I had to have been, right? Sounds roughly correct. So, yeah, that was 2011. The only reason why I remember that fight, I think that was the last time, was that the last fight Nick Charles ever announced? Remember they let him, he was like, he was already near the end and they they brought him in for that for that one time to like to do a one fight. That might have been it. Yeah. I think it was. And he sounded great. He looked great. You know, that was sad. But anyways, that's when they started featuring him as an HBO fighter, even though I didn't find him to be like super exciting or anything like that. He got the job done. But like you said, you know, um, uh, let's see. It was, yeah, he beat Salido and then he beat Wanma. Those are like his big, you know, his big wins in the early 2010s. Also, Roman, you know, Rocky Martinez was a good win. And um, he also beat Juan, Bur you know, Carlos Burgos. But like after that, like you said, then it starts getting a little picky. And that's what I mean, like. That bottom list right there, those are solid wins, but like each one of them is not like, oh my god, that's gonna put you immediately in the Hall of Fame. By the time he already beat up Juan Ma, Juan Ma was already like, you know, damaged goods from Orlando Salido. The Salido fight was crazy because <clears throat> he gets dropped multiple times, but he keeps on coming, and keeps on coming, and by the time he's actually starting to hum on Garcia a little bit, Garcia gets hit with like a headbutt and immediately, you know, like quits and stuff like that, citing a broken nose. I mean. You know, it, it was just... Yeah, his reputation took a little bit of a hit after that. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I, I feel like I want to stay consistent with the shit I kind of say with about, like, injuries and stuff like that. I'm not sure. going to call a fight, a fighter a quitter. I'm not going to get down on a fighter for, like, you know, like a broken nose, broken orb orbital, broken hand, broken arm, you know, anything that's where it's like a fucking injury. A fighter probably should not be fighting through that. And I understand that these like crusty old fucks who are talking about like, well, what about fucking, you know, Carmen Basilio got his fucking skull split in half by an ax and fought through that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's like those kinds of injuries are memorable because they are crazy and probably those fighters should not have fought through that. So let's not perpetuate that shit. But yes, Mikey Garcia's reputation took a hit after that shit because other fighters have indeed fought through broken nose or whatever. And he seemed to be like the timing. It was bad timing because it happened right when Salido had started kind of laying it on him a little bit, which was like Salido's signature shit, like coming on late and kind of beating fighters up, you know, even if he was losing or whatever. And that's anyway, that didn't really look good for Garcia on that in that regard. But like you said, still hung through and got a number of wins at like the 126, 130 pound divisions. Again, though, Hall of Fame level. Yeah, I, I absolutely. You know yeah, what I mean? It I wasn't even <laughs> because it, it went quickly from when he was, you know, in the lower weights, and then he was back. Then you got to remember too, he was with top rank back then. So what they were angling for, as they top rank seemed to be doing with any guy that was like a top lightweight or something, they were like building up to eventually fight Pacquiao in some kind of super fight because they were doing it with Garcia. And then when he when Garcia jumped ship, Lomachenko took that mantle. But um, and Crawford too. They dangled that Crawford for Crawford too, yeah. for a minute, yeah. But I don't think they ever really wanted to make that with Crawford. I, they definitely wanted to do it with Lomachenko, and I know they definitely wanted to do it with Mikey. But you know, neither one actually panned out. So after that happened, I don't know what the difference was, but Mikey said, "Fucking, he left top rank." As a lot of fighters end up doing, or just losing, you know, various promoters. And that's when he went to PBC, and that's when like the spottiness starts happening, where he starts like belt chasing and just kind of jumping divisions. For like, you know, the biggest purses as opposed to like, okay, I'm going to settle in and try to get some work done, you know, because he beat some, I can never pronounce that dude's name, Jean Zaglamican, you know, that the lightweight from back then, the little short oh, stubby. Zlati Trinian, yeah. Yeah, who got absolutely drilled by Mikey in that fight. And he beats Broner. And I mean, the Broner win is still like, Broner was already on the skids at this point, but still like, that was a big enough fight that like, that was a good win for him. And... Then he took some time off, came back, he fought Lippin Nets, Robert Easter, and after that, that was it. You know what I mean? Because after he beat Easter, that's when he decided to jump up by Errol Spence, like, almost a year later, and then Jesse Vargas' fight was just kind of, he went life and death with him, and then he lost to Sandor Marvin. So when you look, so when I look at his record from right here, I'm not going to, like, it's not something for me that's going to compel me to vote for him. But that being said, I can see him getting in from the voters. 
where it really gets slanted as far as like, you know, the the belts just fucking flying around and being handed right. out like candy is that like three quarters of the names that we just mentioned on Mikey Garcia's resume, including some of the dudes were somebody who's just like a, you know, a sometimes fan, a casual fan, or even a hardcore fan, but just not a super hardcore fan might be listening in. They'd be like, oh, I'm not sure who that is. They're like two division champions and shit. And it's yeah. like, but, but that just, you know, adds to the argument like, oh, see, Mikey Garcia's got like a five division champion. He's got like a three division, you know, it's like, yeah. no, dude, come on, fuck. But that's where it starts. That's where it starts getting kind of absurd with like the numbers of belts and shit like that. You know, that's just the nature of the fucking era that we're living in now, too. But that's what we're here for, to sift through the bullshit so that you're not just believing the Leo Gomez multi-division hyperbole. Oh, poor Leo Gomez, man. Let's just use that for Broner from now on, all right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was a couple shows ago. We just talked about yeah. these completely yeah, these ridiculous multi-division yeah. champions. So, and then you got Lucian Butte. Was the new, who the latest guy on this ballot, and that's a major head scratcher too because he falls into the same category as a lot of these other guys do. Where I look at this and I'm like, why did he make this? How did he make this? But it's because was it because of longevity? Butte wasn't around, you know. He he when he was hot when he was a hot he was hot. Don't get me wrong, like people were really high on his coattails, and for the fact that like he wasn't a part of the Super Six at first, and he was getting all this business done outside of it, made people even more salivating to see him because. Well, all of those guys were on Showtime back then, right? Like, you know, um, Andre Ward and Frotch and Kessler and the rest of the crew. He was on HBO, you know, and he became the super middleweight champion at one point. I forgot who he stopped for the belt. And then, but he he looked like he was a badass dude back then. He was on a rampage, knocking the shit out of everybody, basically. You know what I mean? And he had some spectacular knockouts, including um, the uh, the rematch with uh, Lebrado, and, uh, Lebrado Andrade. Mm -hmm. That was a nasty one. Because that first fight, I mean, you know, that was was Twitter around back then for that first fight. Gosh, I'm trying to think. Maybe, well, I mean, Twitter started in like 2009, or, or no, I'm sorry, it started earlier than that. That was when I joined 2009. <laughs> yeah, but like, when did boxing Twitter as a thing kind of take off? Uh, right. I mean, probably more like 2010, 2011 ish. Okay. Ish, something like that. Like here, let me take a look. Cause I don't even remember exactly when that shit was. Yeah, I'm but... looking up his uh. So, okay, it was two thousand and eight. So yeah, now I wouldn't have been, and it probably people wouldn't have been going nuts or something like that. But I do remember talking about it on the fucking message boards. Um, yeah, be because Marlon Wright, the referee, got like a lot of heat for how he handled the last round. And shit like that, because Andrade hurt the shit out of Butte, and Butte got like a really beneficial count, and you know it's like Marlon Wright was like pushing Andrade off him and shit like that, and you know anyway, it was it didn't look good, but then he you know handled his business in the rematch, like you said. But if you look at his record right here on Box Rec, right, this is the easiest one to say no to out of the three. If you really wanted, you know, out of the the three aforementioned, like him, Porter, and uh, Garcia, because. Even out of this, like, it's, you know, it's the weakest one out of the bunch, his whole resume. Like, for that time that he was hot, so he wins the belt against Alejandro Barrio, that's the guy I was trying to think of, beats up a completely uh, shot, worn, and washed up William Joppy um, and stops him, which, remember how we talked about how in unnecessary fights, Joppy beat up Duran, and I said it came full circle for yep. Joppy one day, this was like the full goes. And Yeah, they all hang around too long and eventually get used as a name for somebody and so that's what happened with Joppy. And then um, the first fight with, and with Andrade, where if you really watch it, you know, he might have got saved in that because that dude was like Dunzo. Beats um, Lugencio Zuniga. Again, that was just like a middling contender that you would see more or less on like, you know, ESPN's Friday Night Fights as you would on anything else. And then, yeah, Andrade again, Edison Miranda, Jesse Brinkley from the contender. <laughs> And then, you know, a faded Glenn Johnson. So by the time he gets absolutely washed by Carl Frotch, that's it. Like, his career never really recovered from that, you know. He wins against Gracia, that, again, that guy's been around for a long time, too, and that's no big win. And then I was there for the Jean Pascal fight. I will say that was the most ridiculous atmosphere I've ever heard in a fight. That was insane, Pat. Like, 
you know, when people talk about like bucket list places to go watch a fight, I always say like Montreal needs to be near the top for anybody because like if you get like a local hero over there and a guy that has a massive following, those motherfuckers will come out. And when they come out, yeah. like they go crazy. And the fact that Butte was absolutely massive in Montreal, and so was um, so was uh, Pascal for that matter, bro. I almost went deaf. Like I was working with Lee that night, and me and Lee took off our headphones and just kind of let ourselves absorb it. And the place just was maddening. But he lost that fight, and he would lose his. You know, he fought uh, James DeGale, which was again that was a draw that I was also working, and then he just his career never recovered after that. So it's like. Where's the Hall of Fame resume that he belongs on the ballot for that? You you got to credit Yvonne Michel, who's who was his promoter for years and years oh. and years. And if you look at Lucien Boutet's uh, box rec, excuse me, Bell Center, Bell Center, Bell Center, Bell Center, Bell Center, yeah. Bell Center, Bell Center, Bell Center. You know, dude was a staple. He became a star in Montreal, um, and a huge name in Montreal, mm-hmm. and he. Unfortunately, that's just not a substitute for actual career accomplishments is the thing. and yeah. But that's kind of the game that we're playing as far as putting a lot of the dudes on the ballot. You know, are they entertaining? Put them on. Are they a big star? Put them on. And he did have some longevity in the super middleweight division. But like you said, dude, the fact that the the big problem was that there were a number of really good super middleweights the entire time he was a champion. And he didn't face any of them. None of them. He finally did. And I and I understand, yeah, like not when he was not when it mattered or not when he was supposed to or not on time or however you want to put it, but they were all facing each other. They were all beating the shit out of each other. And then yep. finally he wound up getting the shot at Carl Frotch and people were like, all right, well, let's see what he could do. And Frotch just wasted him. You know, that was like one of Frotch's biggest wins because I remember people were like, oh, well, now we'll finally see Lucian Boutte. He's been like, you know, on this corner of the super middleweight division. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. now is his time. And that was not his time at all. He got fucking walloped. And so, I mean, that but that's bad. he lost his his biggest fights. And and on top of that, he almost lost a number of other fights that were not very big. The Dennis Gracia fight. I remember he almost lost that shit. He got dinged around real bad in that. Uh, you know, there was anyway, he got, mm-hmm. he got knocked out real bad by Gennady Golovkin and the amateurs and like oh, the, yeah. the world yeah. amateur championships and like fucking maybe it was like 2001 or something like that. I mean, anyway, yeah, dude, uh, it, that's not, that doesn't count toward his resume or being hall of fame or anything. Cause if you're going by that logic, then like Riddick Bo doesn't deserve or some shit, but in any case, not nah, dude he's he doesn't belong and the whole point like i said earlier is that that's taking up a spot somebody else should be getting you know that's that's uh you know who's who's the dude uh scully is always fucking whining about oh, yeah yeah i mean and scully's a whining idiot but nonetheless marlon starling <laughs> does deserve to be on the fucking ballot you know what i mean uh, in place of lucian Boutet, at least you know what i'm saying so anyway like it's that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me at the uh, and like you said, Lucian yeah, like, is one of the well, like why wouldn't Marlon Starlin out? be on the ballot? For instance, like this is a dude when you look at his whole career reference like brother and stuff like that. Sure, he wasn't the top welterweight of the eighties. You know what I mean? That was the one of the most stacked of star studded divisions of in boxing history, basically, when it comes down to yeah, it. Head, it's head, just bad timing on his part. He was a very good timing, fighter. But, but at the same time, he was still a lot like when it comes down to after, all right, so after Leonard, after Hearns, you know, Duran, even though Duran only had a handful of fights at Welch, where you still got to put him in that in that upper echelon, right? And then from there, you go to Curry, right? And even though Curry beat him twice, and, you know, Starling had the more longevity in that division in terms of just, like, overall overall work. Like currently, you know, when Curry's star was was uh, was bright. I mean, it was bright as shit. Like everyone thought he was gonna be the heir apparent to like the best fighter in the world or whatever it's gonna be. But like when he got sparked, that was it. He never really recovered from that, you know. And so Starlin, though, consistently he was just always there. You know what I mean? Like he wasn't supposed to beat Mark Breland the first time he beat him. Definitely should have got that win in the rematch. Um, <clears throat> also, he beat uh, Lupe Aquino. Um, Simon Brown, you know, when before they be uh, either one of them became champions, and yeah, bro, like you know, Simon Brown's another one, yeah, 
Absolutely, I've mentioned Simon Brown countless times. It makes no sense. Like, why is the Simon Brown on the Boxing Hall of Fame ballot? For that what doesn't reason? make any yeah, that doesn't make any sense, okay. dude. Especially in place of these other dudes who just don't really belong. That's what I'm saying. So, like, if you want to look at this ballot here, and this is the thing that like gets me as being a head scratcher. All right. Arthur Abraham's on the ballot. You know what I mean? Arthur Abraham probably has more of a probably has more of um uh what's the word I'm thinking of here? A more of a, or... a more of an argument, more as an argument to be on the ballot than Butte does when it comes yeah, down to I would it. agree. Yeah. But he, you know but right? even then he's got yeah, it's got shaky. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I mean, like, I'm not gonna like go over there and be like, eh, whatever. I mean, Abraham did have longevity in the division and all that. He was a good champion. Um, Yuri Barkachev, same thing. I can understand why he made the battle. No problem. Jorge Arce, Paul Yael is a little bit of a head scratcher, but I, you know, I guess the tap you want to kind of push him over. But then you go down, you go down, and you're gonna look and you go, Arte Gregorian. And that's one that you just kind yeah, of like held the WBO title like forever, but never unified, never and then on top of that, just rode the kind of WBO mandatory train for exactly. For a number of years, on, he never farm in America until the one time when he, like, you know, cashed out against Asselino Freitas and lost the decision. Then he retired from there. So why would he make the ballot, you know? Why wouldn't a guy like Simon Brown be on it instead? And it's like... So, like, what's, what would be another guy for you when you kind of look at it and you're just kind of like, what the fuck are they well, doing that's, there? It, that's the, it, almost the exact same kind of fucking boat as Gianfranco Rossi. But yeah. I at least have some sort of understanding for that one because I think he still holds the fucking record for defenses at junior middleweight, which is, again, but like I said, it's kind of like it gets shaky, dude. This is where the whole fucking alphabet organization game starts mm -hmm. to get fucking dumb and you got to start making special fucking asterisks for this and that. And yeah, dude, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Like I, I, I could at least see a better argument for guys like Nazarov and Arbachikov who were very good and had a little bit more longevity, fought fought and defeated better fighters. The yep. problem uh, with both of them is that they never really came back from losses or never really showed a whole lot of like adversity, you know, went through adversity, which is like, you know, that's kind of a problem. But sure. there are other fighters on here that like, I mean, guys who you could pick out, you know, Chris John is that's kind of shaky too, dude. Cause you start talking about longevity where he basically refused to fight other fighters who were very good in his same division at the time and kind of just said, Hey, fuck it. I'm fighting at home. I'm gonna be a star here. And that's your decision. But then, you know, we re reserve the right to be like, pass, you know, <laughs> that's, that's you know, that's kind of how it is. A lot of people believe that Juan Manuel Marquez defeated him when they fought I didn't think that that was a clear win for Marquez whatsoever. You know, I thought that he waited sure. and messed around way too much, but fine. You know, you want to do that. I guess I could at least see the arguments same. Similarly with Henry Maskey, like the and Darius Mikulczewski too. Omar Narvaez, same, 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 same. All of these dudes, longevity, almost either uh, uh, no unification or little unification, but like, you know, it, some of them it's just kind of you got to shrug and be like yeah they're never going to get in uh they have a handful of things working against them the lack of unification the lack of big fights and unfortunately the u.s bias too you know what i mean there's the vast majority of voters are american vast majority of them are not going to vote for foreign fighters that they're not really that aware of and a lot of those fighters fall under that fucking umbrella and the number of them have just kind of puffed up records and it's interesting because, like, I've had, you know, I'm one of the very few people that got a Hall of Fame vote without being Sorry, a Sorry, real quick. I meant Aki, not Mikulczewski. Mikulczewski actually has a little bit more of a legit claim. Oh, I have Aki. no problem. I have absolutely no problem with Mikulczewski being on the ballot whatsoever. Yeah, I meant Sven Aki, not Mikulczewski. Yeah. Not to say that I would be voting for him. Like, maybe if it's a lean year, I can kind of look at his record a little bit more, but, like, Mikulczewski definitely, I mean, even though he did what he ran the WBO coattails like a lot of those guys did back then, too, he did fight legit guys and beat them. And he did and, unify, but and he the, did. Unified against the Virgil sanctioning Hill. body shenanigans were fucked at that point. Sure, but, you know, I got to give him credit for the fact that, like, that it wasn't just, like, you know, a bunch of, like, unknown European fighters that he was, like, feasting on or, like, you know, faded this guy's or whatever. 
sure some of them were like a little past it, like you know Montel Griffin or like you know Derek Harmon or this one and that one, but like those were still recognizable names, and he was getting older too as the at that point when he was beating these guys. And in his biggest fight, when he had to unify against Virgil Hill, because Hill was the only one that was willing to go to Germany to fight him, um, he beat him, and that was a legit win for him. It wasn't like it was controversial, and Hill, like, you know, got robbed, and yada, yada, yada. No, nah, that was, like, a good win for Mick Wachowski, and that put him as the basically the man in the division, and that was, like, it was always, is he going to fight Roy? Is he going to fight Roy? Is he going to come to America? Is Roy going to go over there? Like, that was always that deciding thing for those weird time from, like, 1998, until, but actually until Mikkel Chesky finally lost to Roy victim, you know, Julio Gonzalez. But at that point, Mikkel Chesky was already showing a ton of chinks in his armor and all that. Yeah. So, Well, and technically, uh, well, he unified and it was against Risha Gianni, who is his own, who is also a very good fighter and basically kind of lost to yeah. history for a handful of reasons. But, um, but he was, you know, Mikkel Chesky, that is considered the lineal heavyweight or a light heavyweight champion. But then it became complicated because Roy unified the actual belts, some of which were stripped from Mikulczewski. And yeah. so it became, you know, a, a dumb and complicated situation. But I will only I will say this for Mikulczewski. Um, I know there are going to be a lot of U.S. fans, especially if they listen to this or watch this. They're going to be like, I hate this bearded fucking asshole now. But sorry to tell you this. Mikulczewski was a much bigger star in Germany than Roy ever was in the U.S. <laughs> Sorry, and you got to say that for a lot of those, of a lot of those fighters in Germany. That bro. fool was selling out like fifty thousand seat fucking shits, like fucking three yes. times a year, bro. He, they were like pulling in massive ratings on German TV. I mean, was dude was a huge, huge star. Look at Henry Maske, another guy that that's also, also a massive guy. star. That's what I'm saying, Henry Maske. I'm not excellent fighter. I'm not even an excellent, excellent fighter. Very, you know, one more difficult style to kind of navigate and all that. Like, really, oh, really good fighter. Frustrating. But, frustrating as fuck to fuck with the fight, and frustrating as fuck to watch. His fights were not exciting. I'm just, you oh, gotta man. be honest with that. You know what I mean? Like, he had a couple of close calls where I forgot who he fought early on in early on in his reign, where he almost lost. It might have been Rochigiana, actually, and um where he just like gasped, but usually it was just a shutout. You know what I mean? He's compact behind that high guard, boom, boom, boom. But he was massively popular. You know, I remember the first time I read about him in Ring Magazine and one of the early issues I got as a kid, and they were, you know, the whole thing was talking about how much of a big star he was over there, you know, posing with motorcycles, with the photo shoots, yada, yada, yada. And they said that his fights were regularly selling out before his opponent was even announced. They was be like, yo, Maske is coming back May 25th, and the whole place would be selling out immediately. He can be fighting the local drunk down the block. They would still be going for it. Like, yeah, dude. It was, it was during this era. Even Sven Otke, similarly, just yeah. an awful style, zero punching power, huge star. And nobody you know, understood. As much as people want to have revisionist history if they want about Roy, as talented as Roy was, and there's no doubt he was pound for pound the best fighter on the planet for a number of years back then, he wasn't that popular. Why do you think he was always fighting in, like, you know... Never Oklahoma a big draw, ever. Or, like, somewhere, yeah. He never just had, like, a home base besides Tampa yeah, where he's fighting in, like, like, Foxwoods. Yeah. Which was not a big venue. Fighting in, like, you know, fucking Biloxi. Fighting it, you That's know. That's what I'm saying, yeah. None of and these places like, were big venues or anything, and almost none of them were, like, sellouts or shit, like, you know? Because look at the competition he was fighting, too. He was fighting the easiest dudes and mandatories that he was going to pick apart. And since he had the the power in his contract to, to fight whoever he wanted and HBO would have to air it, he didn't give a shit. And HBO's not going to put fights like this in Madison Square Garden or somewhere in Vegas or do this or do that. You got to put it where it's going to be appropriately going to sell, you know, and that's what the promoters did, too. And so, like, yeah. You know, as good as Roy was, he definitely wasn't the biggest star back then. And I don't even think, I, I would hope to think that most fans would realize yeah. that. <laughs> He wasn't a close lot of, to what it was, you know, or like a lot of those dudes, you know. Revisionist history is the perfect term for it, dude, because that's exactly what it is. Um, a lot of people see the highlights in the videos and the TikToks or whatever the fuck, and they're and they're fun, you know, they're exciting. The you know behind the back fucking shit, yeah, all yeah, that yeah. it's great, dude, you know. But a lot of people also forget that when that shit was going on, he was getting fucking cut in half by writers left and right who were like, all right, dude, let's stop milking this HBO, blah, blah, blah. And that, you know, I get it, you know, the pound for pound stuff. And he definitely was either on top 
of or in the top few of pound for pound lists all throughout much of the 90s. But like, you know, there was criticism and he was never a big star. I, I know that that's not what people think or they want to hear, but he was never a big star. So point is, you know, both Mikulczewski and Roy had responsibilities to fight one another. You can't necessarily blame one or the other. I'm simply that's saying that. that if you're talking about financials or whatever, there is less of a reason for Mikulczewski to leave Germany than there was for Roy to leave the U.S., which Roy obviously knew because specifically around that time during interviews, he was like, I'm not leaving because look at what happened to me in Seoul in South Korea. Like he, he was like fucking 10 years later, which, yeah, I get. But then you got to take the hit for, for making that decision, Roy. That was percent. And I, you know, so that's, that's where it stood too. And it's kind of interesting that it's like, Roy would always, he was always teasing shit back then. You know what I mean? Whether it was going to be fighting Mikulczewski or he's going to fight Hawkins or he's going to finally go to heavyweight or he's going to do this or do that. It was always just kind of like a big illusion with him. But I think this creates actually a decent segue when you talk about Mikulczewski and the light heavyweights and Roy Jones in particular, because he can break up Antonio Tarver, who's also, you know, makes his appearance on the ballot for, he's been on the ballot for a while now. But, you know, Tarver, in my eyes, makes a more interesting case each year that I look at his record. From like the first time I started, I just kind of dismissed him. But then when you actually look at it and start like, you know, studying what he did, he wasn't, didn't have the longest career. But what he did in his career, you know, aside from kind of, you know, later on stuff and like the steroids or whatever, he did a great, he had a great body of work. Tarver, you said? Tarver, yeah. Yeah, no, he he especially um, a lot of with the number, the same with a number of these fighters, he, he just kind of suffered from the timing. And he's also yeah. kind of suffering from the timing on the ballot, too. Um, basically, he went through a pretty good portion of the light heavyweight division, and he was never a massive star himself and had to mm -hmm. work his way up. Um, and I know that there are a handful of reasons for that. He was, what, on the 96? He was 96. on the 96 team, right? Yeah, was... Um, he was, lost. so I, I... So, not to cut you off, like, I want to say... I don't know if he was the captain. I don't, I don't know if it was either him or, him or Clay Bay or maybe Nate Jones was captain of the team. But that doesn't really matter in retrospect. What matters is that Tarver was one of the guys that was getting the most attention from that team and was, like, slated to win gold medal, absolutely. You know, he had a lot of, like, because they had a lot, he was the oldest, he's one of the oldest guys on the team, I think, aside from Clay Bay, had a lot of, you know, a very, very extensive uh, amateur career, was obviously very successful throughout it, and I think he was the reigning world champion, or might have been. Um, I, I know he was a decorated amateur, but yeah. I'd have to look, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, but, regard, I don't know, maybe he wasn't, but, like, what ended up happening was that when he went to Atlanta, and then, you know, without even meddling, I think... Did he medal? Did he get a bronze or he just like lost? Yeah, no, early? he, yeah, no, he, he got a medal. You got beaten by Vasily. You got beaten by, uh, by Jeroff. Yeah. Yeah. And Jeroff was the fucking gold medalist. Mm -hmm. And so of course, I don't want to speak out of my ass. So now I got to, I know I got to look. Yeah, he definitely did lose the Jeroff. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah. yeah he was, was a bronze a medalist. Well, yeah. yeah. 31 bronze. Yeah. But even then, that was looked upon as being like kind of disappointing because I guess everyone was saying in Atlanta he didn't show his full potential. And someone alluded to that I guess McDonald's sponsored the '96 team, and Tarver spent a good portion of the time hanging out by those by those booths eating Big Macs and shit. So who knows? But like you said, though, by the time he turned pro, he didn't really have the star power that the rest of the team did, just because like that, you know, him not him only getting a bronze and kind of you know puttering out the way he did at the Olympics definitely hurt. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's a number of other fighters on that team. I mean, almost everybody on that team went on to do something in the pros, uh, if not win world titles or come really close. Larry Clay Bay, you know, had a handful of really good fights. He was also a really good amateur. He knocked out, I think he knocked out Joe Messi in the amateurs. Yeah. Excuse me. He was, but he was a really good amateur, not quite as good as a pro, but he was also kind of lazy, often showed up kind of like not in very good shape. He was Nate, older too. Yeah, he was also older. Nate Jones, good pro, didn't really achieve his potential either. Roshi Wells definitely did not. 
you know, go on to uh, live up to his potential. David Reed probably overachieved considering, you know, he entered. Yeah, considering he was already kind of behind the game. But Fernando Vargas, Mayweather Jr., and believe it or not, Eric Morrell. I remember Eric Morrell was was definitely talked about. um, But, I mean, being with the lower weights, he's already kind of behind the eight ball, as it were. But yeah, Antonio Tarver was considered not as big a star or didn't have as much potential as a number of these other fighters in the pros. He had to kind of scrape up the hard way. So, I mean, got to give him some credit for that. He did, because I remember early on when when I was after he turned pro in like the 96 team, all of them were being featured on television at some point, at some point or another, you know, like the ones reserved for stardom, like David Reed, he made his debut on HBO. Um I think he was the only one that made it his debut on like prime time like that. Uh, Floyd debuted on, I want to say ESPN two or something or like one of those shows, ESPN, whatever. But soon enough, you started seeing him on pay-per-view, like on the undercards. Vargas, I want to say the same thing. He didn't debut on HBO. He debuted on some shit like that, but he was already being featured on TV. Hell, even Terrence Coffin, uh, another dude who didn't really pan out a lot as a pro, but he had a long career and, you know, relative success. He debuted like they all came out on paper, you know, on whatever. Like they were being featured. It was a it was a popular team, but Tarver was just kind of like on the wayside. Like I remember watching him on Tuesday night fights, and he was fighting out of like fucking um, Blue Horizon or like places like that. You know, nothing wrong with that at all. I'm just saying like that's what like how he was coming up. You know, and Atlantic City. He was more so on the East Coast. I don't know if he was aligned with Russell Peltz or not. He might have been, but it was. It was almost like back then for Tarver that it seemed like they were trying to figure out how to like how to um how to uh what's I always get tongue tied with these words right now, man. I don't know what's wrong with me today. Yeah, like how, how to, to promote or market them basically. Yeah, 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 exactly. Market them. How the how to market them basically. Because remember back in his early days, he came in like a full magic gear because he was called the magic man. And he had the tape <laughs> and he had the hat and he had the suit yep. and the cane and all this dumb shit, like until they re- realized the man could talk. Like, he could cut a promo almost as good as anybody. I mean, Tarver has a good neck and fucking yap. <laughs> and if he just let him talk. And I know his, his style, too, was, like, kind of plotting. You know what I mean? It wasn't just, like, very aesthetic to watch. And he wasn't, like, blowing guys out. It was just kind of... But by the time he finally comes up and he knocks out, I think it was um after his first loss. Because he loses to Eric Harding. And that definitely put a debtor in him for a minute. Because Harding broke his ribs, beat him up. Tarver went down in that fight. And you kind of thought, okay, at this point what's going to happen. But when he came back and he knocked out Chris Johnson, I don't know if you remember that point where he laid that poor dude out and got him moved on a stretcher. That's when things took a turn. For yep. him. Yeah. I remember that shit. And I actually remember the first Harding fight um, because there was a big deal made out of the fact that Tarver broke his jaw too. in that fight. And so he had to take like, I think he had to like get his jaw wired shut and had to take time off and stuff like that. And that uh, Chris Johnson fight was his first like bigger fight back or whatever. And yeah, dude, that was, that was bad. Um, and that was kind of like exactly when he started kind of gunning for Roy Jones. Yeah. From what I understand, uh, I don't know how rivalries work in Florida, bro. I only know how bath salts work in Florida and <laughs> shit. But I know that, I know that um, when it comes to amateur fights, you know, uh, Florida at least used to be one of those hotbeds uh, in recent years or less recent years i should say in other eras and in portions of florida that aren't the fucking hicksville that i, th- I want to say where's tarver from tampa or something like that right yeah i'm about to look okay he's from orlando See, okay I don't, that's what i'm saying i don't know the fucking layout of florida bro i know that i only know that like there's a handful of like larger cities all clustered and then like the rest is spread out and like basically pensacola but that uh <laughs> Anyway, point being that I think that he felt that there was an amateur rivalry, or at least in his head, that there was some sort of rivalry with Roy Jones. Roy Jones was a star, and Antonio Tarver was the rightful heir and star, and he was you know, Roy yeah. Jones was the one getting the credit and getting the attention and stuff like that. Point being, that was exactly when Antonio Tarver kind of went into that persona or whatever, where he was like, I'm chasing Roy Jones, and like that's that's it. I'm beating him up and I'm his worst nightmare and type of stuff. Yeah. And that was actually, like you said, it was kind of like the promos he cut was he started following Roy Jones around and like showing up at his press conferences and shit yeah. like that. Like, when are you going to fucking fight me, Roy? You know, stuff like that. 
that's old school shit. You know, it's it is old school, man. Not every he, not every I mean, fighter does that. Remember Aaron Pryor was chasing Sugar Ray Leonard and everyone else that you might that anyone that like within thirty pounds of him during the early eighties before he can get a you know a major fight. He was doing shit like that. I mean, it happens to a lot of fighters. <laughs> Hey, dude, you know, when you when you don't have the promotional power or connections or whatever, you got to do something. And I mean, I guess a real quick way of doing it is pissing somebody off. Guarantee you, Tarver was a Clever Lane fan. <laughs> Come on, right. Rock. You made me wait. Yeah. Hey, woman. Hey, woman. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, so, you know, to Tarver for his credit, I mean, like, that. this is the thing is that this is where you can start looking at his, cre- his career and his record and you'd be like, all right. Maybe you can, on a lean year, he can definitely get in because Reggie Johnson is a very underrated name. We've discussed him in the past, and Tarver absolutely don't, you know, beat him by it was a close decision, but like maybe closer than it needed to be. You know what I mean? Like Johnson usually got like the benefit of the doubt sometimes, even if he lost in terms of how close things were. But the Eric Harding fight, that was really impressive in that rematch. I mean, we've discussed that, you know, on the show and off the show for very because first off, you know, the knockout is ridiculous. Like, you know, Harden just gets absolutely obliterated. But you got to remember before that, he was whooping Tarver still. Again, like, it was almost like Tarver just had a... His style didn't work well with him, and Hardick was getting the better of him until Tarver just landed this massive nuke that... You okay? Well, I'm from Philadelphia. <laughs> and... <laughs> yeah, dude, dude. Yeah, fucking... all excited. That was that Southpaw versus Southpaw matchup, dude. Some yeah. Southpaws can't handle that shit. And that was a that was a clear case of Eric Harding. Well, first, Harver not being able to handle the Southpaw. Dude, two counterpunchers, two Southpaw counterpunchers who can punch. Nightmare. Nightmare fucking style for both of them. And Antonio Tarver was having shitloads of trouble with Harding again. And then all of a sudden, he fucking just started catching him with that overhand left. Like, he, like, couldn't miss. And he was just like, boop. Boop, boop, but like hit him with like fucking yeah. like twelve of them, and Harding finally was just like, "All right, yeah." And, then, and that was probably the. uh I'm pretty sure that made it to Sports Center. Probably. I'm almost positive it did at the time because he the, he gets up and he's clearly dazed. Eric Harding is and he's like fucking uh doesn't know which way is up, and the ref's like, "Where are you?" Or no, no, he says, "How are you doing?" Or we want to continue. He goes, "I'm from Philadelphia." And it's like you can almost think like in a, in in your head you're like, are you trying to say Philly fighters are tough? Okay, okay, okay. Or was he just so fucking loopy that he was like, I'm from Philadelphia. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know. You don't I know. I thought he was from Texas. Not Texas. I thought he was from Connecticut. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea where he's from. To be totally honest, all I know is that it made for some pretty fucking good TV. <laughs> it did. You know what? Larry Merchant, you know, a Philly native himself, got very hyped when you heard that. Right? Remember? He was like, "Did you hear Eric Carding? Referee asked him if he's okay. He said, "I'm from Philadelphia." <laughs> yeah, he like repeats it back, like the audience didn't just see it five seconds ago. That was a cool moment. I gotta give. I, I that that was a good response. It I'm was. Good. What the fuck you asking about? I'm from Philly. Like, let's go. <laughs> now I'm about um, to look this up right now. Like, is he even from Philly? Okay, he says he's born in Philly. All right, fair enough. Right, fair enough. Cool. Okay, so he wasn't lying. <laughs> Man, he saw you got shell shocked for a minute and just got his connections wrong. Instead of saying I'm from Hartford, Connecticut, I'm from Philadelphia. <laughs> you definitely got to stop the fight. I'm but, disowning um, Willie Pep. I'm from Philadelphia. But, like, look, you know, he beat Montel Griffin, in which he dominated Griffin, and Griffin was still serviceable for there, and then, like, the Roy Jones fights, which he did, and, like, you know, then the Glenn Johnson fights, too, like, the, he lost the first one, the first one was super close, but I thought Johnson edged it, but to his credit, he came back and comprehensively beat him in the rematch, and, you know, after the third Jones fight, things kind of skidded from, because, you know, fight, again, this was during the the mid-2000s, where anytime Hopkins stepped up, you thought he was, this was going to be the, the end for him. And the Tarver fight was supposed to be that, which it wasn't. Hopkins put on one of his best performances of his career. Yeah. And, but even then, when, like, you know, you think, okay, Tarver definitely kind of fell off after this point, which he did. He was a lot older than people realize. Like, he was already close to 40 at this point. And he lost to Chad Dawson twice in both dreadful ass fights. But I mean, Clinton Woods is a decent name. And you got to give him credit for, you know, beating uh, Danny Green. Soon after Green had knocked out Roy, you know, his nemesis Roy in the first round. So, yeah, he kind of stayed. And, and the, 
if he had actually managed to get a win over Latif Coyote, like I'm not saying I ever really thought super highly of Latif Coyote, but it would have been a fairly impressive win to move up to cruiserweight and defeat an at the time undefeated contender. But I got to give him some credit because it did give us the post fight quote from Latif that I fuck he up. I fuck he up. <laughs> that was the first time Showtime did like a fucking four or five fight card, right? That was just regular showtime and it was, it was dreadful it was like the word like every single fight was awful yeah oh my god it was who was it leo santa cruz was one of them peter quillen or they I just like went the fucking walk. distance or you know it was like yeah, fucking peter like quillen what the fuck went, right yeah, yeah that yep yep it was uh leo santa cruz vusi malinga austin trout delvin rodriguez <laughs> oh boy. saki obika oh, dia god. davis Bro, you can't ah! you can't schedule Saki Obika on the card and think it's gonna be all right. Yeah, nah, it was. Alan but, Davis kid, I know he got mauled that night. <laughs> yeah, that was that's the Rif Richard Schaefer special right there, bro. The 2012 Richard Schaefer special. Just throw a bunch of names on the fucking card and hope it goes all right. That was fucking weak, bro. So, who would you want to talk about that you want to like, you know, warrant discussion on? All right, yeah, we went off for a minute, but let me take a look here. Um, Sorry, good name to talk about for a minute. No, for sure, and I do think that he he at the very least deserves uh, consideration on the ballot. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, let's see. I do say I I would say that this is another pair of fighters who I'd like to see get in, and unfortunately, they're also suffering from the timing on the ballot, and also suffering uh, in addition to the timing, the fact that they're not American. There is a massive pro-U.S. bias when it comes to inducting fighters. There's absolutely no question about that. That has been called out by a number of like British, uh, British writers and stuff like that, especially. And they're 100% correct. They're not uh, lying about that at all. That being said, excuse me, two fighters I'd love to see get in and get in together if possible are Nigel Benn and Chris Eubank. Um, you know, those are two fighters where, like I said, they're this this ballot's middle heavy. These are two of the guys stuck right in the middle where they probably deserve to get in, uh, both in terms of um, career accomplishments. They might be somewhat thin. I'm not going to lie. Might be a sure. little bit on the thin side. But if you are going to factor in the kind of entertainment factor, like like many did for Israel Vasquez and Rafael Marquez, for instance, um, you know, when they gave either of them their votes, I know Vasquez isn't in yet, but Rafa Marquez did get in. I wanted to see Vasquez get in with them. That would have been cool. But similarly, if you're taking into account the entertainment factor, taking into account popularity, contribution to box to the British boxing scene in the late eighties and early nineties, I don't think there's any question whatsoever. However, then if I'm also going to put them, you'd have to fucking ask the question, where's Steve Collins, bro? I mean, Collins definitely could warrant being on the ballot as well. And that's one. Don't even get me started on Subul yeah. Collins right now for that. But like, so, you know, but, but going back to like, you know, when we're kind of shifting out some of these names and going, why are they there? Why isn't he there in place? So and so, yeah. you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, but those are, that's fascinating too, because like, you know, those are both names that were massively popular when we became fans in like the early nineties. You know what I mean? Like I read more about Eubank because Ben was always featured on Showtime at that point. You know, Eubank, by the time I became a fan, I don't think Eubank was featured on TV like that anymore, unless it was, you know, like Sky or some shit like that. But regardless, I became a Ben fan, you know, and the thing is when you look at, if you go head to head with Ben and Eubank's record, right? I honestly think Ben has the better resume when it just comes like, you know, comparatively, even though Ben lost to Eubank and got a draw in that rematch, which he probably He's got should've... more big wins. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely. just head to head. He lost to Bank or Eubank. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, he lost to Michael Watson too. Okay, fine. Watson was one of those guys that if he didn't suffer that injury, he definitely would have became a world champion at some point during the nineties. And, um, but when he came to it, the thing about Eubank, the thing about Ben, in uh in comparison to Eubank is that Ben came to America in the late 80s in 1989 up until like 1990 91 he had like this excursion excursion over here and that brought him prominence to American fans that I've heard about him but I didn't really know what to expect 
And Ben back then was like fucking animal. All right, like that dude just yeah. did not he, give a shit. He was everything that people believe Mike Tyson was. Yes. Like yeah. when people think of Mike Tyson and they get this distorted fucking thing of Mike Tyson, that was actually Nigel Ben. Thousand percent. <laughs> you know? And for his well, how many fights did he have in America? For his for his five fights I, that he yeah, had. I was gonna he, say he, four he, or five or something. Yeah, and he was raising absolute fucking hell. You know, he Jorge Amparo was one of those dudes who was like uh just a complete journeyman fighter, but I had been in with a lot of different guys and you know, Ben went the distance with him. All right. Samuel Lyon Williams is another one. Samuel Lyon Williams is one of my favorite journeymen of all time. That dude gave everybody fits and gave a young James Tony his first draw, you know, his draw in the, you know, early on. And Ben, like the rest of them, won a decision, but it was close enough because Williams is just that type of slick dude. But it's his last two fights in America that just people were just like, holy shit. Because, like, you know, like you said, it represented everything that Tyson was supposed to be, but Ben was somehow even nastier about it. Like, he just had this attitude. He'd walk in the ring where Ben had like the characteristics of like George Foreman, Sonny Liston and Tyson rolled into one and just like even more like uncorrigible. You know what I mean? Like the guy just didn't give a shit. So like stomp in there, snort, pissed off, looking around, just walking, waiting, bombs trying to take your ass out. And Doug DeWitt was a good fighter who went in there on anybody and had some decent wins himself. But I mean, he got bombed out in that fight. Like he lasted a decent amount, of, like decent amount of time. He got beat up. It was the Iran Barkley fight, though. That everyone just kind of like, whoa, because <laughs> that was a wild ass shootout. You know what I mean? Everything about it was great. Like Ben comes out there, rampage, and drops Barkley immediately. Punches him while he's on the canvas, like Terry Norris. Stomps around, pissed off. Drops him again. Gets hurt himself, and some you know finishes it off right. And then after the fight's over, gets on a television and just basically goes on this wild rant about how he doesn't give a fuck about what he did. <laughs> and Barkley at the time, you know, was uh, still, you know, he was still pretty fresh in the minds of a lot of U.S. fans for, I don't even yeah. want to talk, don't bring up, don't bring up Tommy Harris. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it, ever. Well, let's say this, bro, like Barkley in 1990, he still had a, I'm not, I won't bring up, I won't bring up Tommy Harris. <laughs> Barkley still had some shit to accomplish in the '90s before this happened, so like that makes that makes this one even more impressive in my mind. Yeah, there was, uh, and actually, it's funny too because if especially if you're talking about entertainment value, Nigel Ben had like, just go onto YouTube, and you'll find like 15 Nigel Ben fights that are all under two or three rounds that are absolute yeah. fucking wars. Like, just, like, back and forth. He's, like, flailing all over in the first round. And then fucking 30 seconds later, he's just, like, throwing punches so hard his arms are almost coming out of the fucking sockets. He's, like, falling over and tumbling because he's thrown so hard. It, it, and, I mean, like, they're messy, they're sloppy, but dude was just a fucking animal. He was just crazy in there. And you know his 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 style did get refined as he kept on you know as the as the nineties prolonged. I got to give him that. Like he wasn't just a wild and Dennis Andres take a punch and throw it from like you know Manchester all the way to Atlantic City type thing. But like he still remained wild. And then as that as the wildness grew on too, like he also his hair grew. Like remember how he got like the dreads and stuff. So anytime he got rocked, it made it kind of cool. Of it made it even more of a visual effect. Cause you see them shits go flying everywhere when he got nailed and he goes skedaddling across the ring. But he, um, you know, by the time he becomes champion in 1993, being Moro Galvano, like he's already, he's, he's madly popular in, in, in England and Europe in general. And like he had that American excursion, he's definitely known to American fans as well. And when he fights uh, Eubank in a rematch in 93. So then that first fight, Eubank stopped him head to head. That was a great fight too. I like, had both of both through, went through shit, but Eubank at that time was the more complete fighter, and it showed later on as he stopped him. But in the rematch, which was aired on Showtime, in a massive, massive fight, Ben definitely deserved to win that fight. You know what I mean? Eubank, by that point, um, how do you describe it? So Eubank, he knocks out Michael Watson, right? The aforementioned Michael Watson. Because that was like the three dudes who were just kind of like picking at each other for supremacy in the middleweight division in the UK and in the world in general. So... Watson beats Ben, and then Watson fights Eubank the first time and loses a close decision. They fight a rematch. Watson's beating him this time, and then he drops Eubank. Eubank gets up, lands a freak punch that just, like, hit him so hard that it 
almost killed him and Watson, you know, subsequently retired from it. And Eubank was never really the same after that. You know what I mean? The same type of dude before that where he was just like cold and knockout puncher in certain ways and everything like that. And something left him, I mean, understandably, when you almost kill a person. So when he fights Ben in the rematch, it wasn't a great fight, but it was one that most people thought Ben should have won. Regardless, yeah. he, and kind he of also started. lost a point too. Ben lost a point for a kind of a freak low blow that people were like, eh. uh, and that also that also uh, lost him the I fight. Think- yeah but it wasn't until you know early 95 when he fights gerald mcclellan where everyone's just kind of like oh shit like that solidifies it all yeah and i mean that's that's kind of the uh unfortunately a handful of these guys who are all around the british scene at the same time all suffered uh either suffered or had an opponent suffer through either a fatal or near fatal accident uh, that resulted from the fight, and the McClellan fight is easily one of the most m- notorious ones of the 1990s for that reason. And it's also, you know, we've talked about this before, and I've mentioned it. It's among those fights where it's almost kind of like taboo to enjoy it because of what happened similarly with Mancini Kim, which was a fucking war, you know, and nobody ever talks about it in that regard, because understandably. But I mean, it's a fucking brutal, vicious, wild, gnarly fight. But because of the outcome of Mancini Kim, nobody really ever talks about it in that context. Like it's one of the greatest fights of the eighties because it was, but it's like, you know, it's kind of awkward to say. Similarly, Ben McClellan, uh, I mean, probably a little bit more foul filled and sloppy than than that. And so for that reason might not get talked about, but also because of the outcome. You know, Ben gets absolutely walloped in the first round through the ropes. People are going, ah, oh, it was more than a 10 count when everybody knows you get 20 when you go through the ropes. So it's all good. But that being said, you know, he's all but out in the first round. Many he could have he could have been stopped in the first round, but for not very good officiating and refereeing, but then worked his way back into the fight, which turned into a bit of a foul fest. And then Ben started just like rabbit punching like a madman. Sure. And it's that was the first fight. I remember that was one of the first early fights I watched with my dad. And I remember I fell asleep. I watched the first round with him, got all excited because I had watched McClellan before that beat Julian Jackson and I was aware of who Ben was. I watched a couple of his fights. So, like, I remember Ben getting dropped. I'm like, oh shit, this is going to end quickly. And then I fell asleep because fucking, what year was it? I was, was 10. Yeah, I was 10 when that happened. You know what I mean, like, I couldn't stay up till 11 p.m. trying to hang around. So, but I remember the next day when I woke up and asked my dad about it and he told me what happened, I was just like completely shocked. You know what I mean? It wasn't until years later when I, you know, we watched the whole thing. And it's a tragic fight for a number of reasons, absolute number of reasons. I mean, first off, McClellan had an absolutely fucking in depth corner. You know, before that fight, a couple of fights before that, yeah, there have been McClellan books written still... about this entire, just, just this fight, you know? Sure. Yeah, McClellan used to be a part of Emmanuel Stewart's camp in the Kronk. You know what I mean? That was a Detroit through and through, and that's where he was developed, and that's where he developed that right hand and everything like that. After a bunch, you know, after they fell out, excuse me, McClellan ended up with this really shady dude from the Midwest named Stan Johnson, who was a trainer, promoter, slash fighter, and one of those guys that just kind of was a stand in that would get knocked out if someone else didn't show up, whatever it was. Like, just. The last person you would think a world class fighter should be hanging out with and really dealing with, you know what I mean? But for whatever reason, McClellan got with him. All his shit got messed up, and you know, the the weight fluctuations that he was kind of notorious for for gaining a ton of weight and then losing it and trying to do all this stuff. It just made for a recipe for disaster. And like you said, the massive amount of rabbit punches that Ben was hitting him with. And then there was at one point too, I forgot what round it was, where they had a bad clash of heads, like a bad clash of heads. Ben came in and boom, hit him right there and it hit McClellan's center in the forehead. And you see McClellan back up and he starts blinking over and over like, you know, it really, and that was probably the catalyst of it too, you know? And um, yeah, the thing that always irks me about that fight though, is that at the end of it, you have Ferdy Pacheco, the fight doctor, basically saying, saying that McClellan quit, quit. And he says it over and over and over. And he was like, he quit. I don't know what happened to him. I've never seen this in my career. I've never seen someone just quit. Like, the fuck do you mean? Bitch, you've watched a lot of fights. You've seen fighters quit. (laughs) Shut up. You're a fucking doctor. You see this man sitting there. I'm going to always say some shit like that. I've never seen this before. Shut up. Yeah, you have. And if, like, even to the untrained (laughs) eye, if you're watching close, 
clearly something is wrong with McClellan. He goes down to his own accord and he's blinking and is like, he just, you can see like his, something's like clearly going on with him. Yeah. And the first thing you to say is no, he just quit. Like, no, the minute he got up, he got up on instinct, walks to his corner, still blinking, still out of it. And then within seconds, he slumps down and he's laying unconscious. I I would like to say, I would love to say, oh, if that happened these days, that would be stopped. But I, no, I don't have confidence no, in that because I also you know, watched. Well, I, I also watched the Magomed Abdus Salamov for several rounds, you know, sitting in his corner, just like. Yep. And they're like talking to him, trying to get him to answer. And he's like, just sitting there looking and I'm tweeting on fucking Twitter. Stop the fight. Stop the fight. Stop the fight. And it goes like three more rounds. So I, I'd love to be confident to say that wouldn't happen nowadays, but I'm not confident whatsoever. So after, you know, so the, the tragic aftermath of that, like Ben still had a couple of defenses, but that was it. Like his career was basically as a top guy was over. You know, he was supposed to fight Roy Jones. There was there was talks for that for a number of times. But again, Roy's big fights never came to fruition. So he loses uh, the belt to Sugar Boy Malinga, uh, underrated guy from that era. And then he has the two fights with Steve Collins that just, you know, you could tell probably Ben just wasn't with it anymore at that point, right? The first fight was like a fluke. He twisted his ankle or some shit and the fight got stopped. And then Collins, I think, beat him up in the rematch before stoppage. And it's like, all right, that was his career. But when you look at the breadth of it and you see like the whole aspect of what he did in the competition that he faced, yeah, he deserving to be in the Hall of Fame and definitely deserving to be on the ballot. And I'm surprised he's been on it for as long as he has. Now, when you look at a guy like Eubank, you know, Eubank and him have similar credentials. But like I said, I think Ben has the bigger names on it. And also, too, is because he did like the U.S. excursion. And um, whereas, well, Eubank, I take that back. Eubank did turn pro in America. But, I mean, he was just fighting against absolute, you know, nothing. Yeah, there's Yeah, there's no recognizable names or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if this is the same Eric Holland I'm thinking of. It is. Interesting. Yeah, there's yeah, okay. there's not a whole Eric lot Hall, of... Eric Holland in his fourth pro fight is the only guy I recognize. That's the dude who, like, had a horrible record but then won on a crazy run at the Blue Horizon at one point and, like, won a number of fights. But anyways... You know, the thing about Eubank is that he never, like, he was always one of those WBO champions. That was always, like, his world champion status, you know what I mean? And he was WBO champion during a time when yeah, it's a good the, point. US, the U.S. in most places didn't really recognize or give a shit. Like, it was cool. It was big in the U.K. It was big in Europe, like, widely recognized over there. And that's why the majority of the champions and the championship fights took place over there. But Eubank was kind of a product of that. But to his credit... He was fighting better competition than I would say the majority of WBO champs were fighting back then, right? You know, instead of just like yeah. bottom of the barrel schlebs, you know, he fought Sugar Boy Malinga, he fought Michael Watson, he fought Ronnie Essett, Tony Thornton, um, Lindell Holmes. Those are legit names. Graziano Chigiani, like Henry Wharton. You know, by the time he finally loses Steve Collins, some of those fights are like, close that he might have should have lost or whatever but i mean that's a pretty good resume of guys to beat and that's a good quality of competition to beat too a lot better yeah. than some of the top guys we see today so he he definitely had the benefit of being a bigger star uh so he didn't really suffer from being like stuck with the wbo or whatever and he also yeah. was among the group of fighters obviously we've talked about this before with the wbo when they became popular now we talked about the quote unquote four belt era and all that type of shit when did that begin there's no real concrete, you know, year or fight that that really happened. It was mostly the heavyweight division that really changed with the WBO and the yeah, recognition. Yeah. However, it wasn't like it was never recognized. It definitely was recognized. But when it comes to the lower weights, uh, Ben and Eubank were two of the fighters that helped kind of like legitimize the organization in the eyes of U.S. fans and U.S. Sure. ranking systems and stuff like that. Um, so I mean like, yeah, it's, it's kind of dodgy. And especially now when I post stuff about either of them on the history shit, I'm kind of like, you know, I'll sometimes get people, if I call them like two division champions, they'll be like, nah, 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 it was WBO. It's not I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, dude, what, a, you know, fucking what, I don't know where it stops and begins anymore, but clearly, uh, that's a good point though, because it isn't to a lot of people. It's not the same. Sure. But I'll give him credit too. Like after he loses twice to Steve Collins which were first one was definitely considered a big upset. Um, 
you know, most people thought like, especially with a guy like Eubanks Eagle and the way he was, they thought he was just kind of right out into the sunset. And initially that's what it looked like he was going to do. But then he came back in 1997. He fought Joe Calzaki for the a rising Joe Calzaki at that for the vacant WBO belt. Lost a, you know, lost a wide decision, but still was like competitive in spots and gave Calzaki a good fight. But his last two fights, dude, against Carl Thompson are so underrated because I'm shocked they're not talked about today. Those are two of the best, like, especially their first fight is one of the best cruiserweight fights ever. Carl Thompson is one of those dudes, bro. Carl Thompson is one of so the Sebastian Rothman fight is yeah. like, is also one of those fights that's like, uh, Rothman thinks he's got shit well in hand and then just gets fucking blasted out of nowhere. And yeah. dude, but Carl Thompson, that dude was a, um, he was a Muay Thai practitioner and a kickboxer earlier in his career. And he fought, he actually trained under a, gosh, what was the dude's name? Master Sken, I believe his name was. Okay. Um, and he, so he was a, a fairly accomplished kickboxer, but then went to boxing and was kind of one of those guys that like, uh, just not super polished, uh, definitely had a very cagey style, but like you could be out boxing them, but just don't sleep, dude, do not yeah. sleep. Cause that's what happened to David Hay too. That's exactly yes. what happened to David Hay. I remember that shit was on like, I think it was on like showtime or something like that and it was just like fucking super random you know uh carl thompson's supposed to be this old veteran dude going down before the up-and-coming david hay and he just fucking blasted and initially ass. he was hey was kicking the, everybody was always beating the shit out of thompson before he that's how him. it always worked bro <laughs> yeah like he was kicking his ass and then all of a sudden you sleep on him and boom but it's fascinating to think man eubank was not a big middleweight or super middleweight he's not a tall guy you know, he was stocky, but he wasn't, like, big. So the fact that he went to cruiserweight, and Thompson was a big cruiserweight, like, you know, wide wide shoulders, tall, lanky. It was a massive size difference, and Eubank was putting fucking paws on him, you know, and especially in that first fight. like, And in the second fight, he was doing the same until his eye grotesquely swelled shut. So it's like, you know, I agree with you, though. I would definitely love to see them both get in at the same time. I think the only time after that in – off the top of my head, that I remember like rivals getting in simultaneously at the Hall of Fame, besides Ali and Frazier, obviously the first year is um. Well, I don't even know if Frazier got in the first year, but uh, uh, is Carbajal and um Chiquita Gonzalez was like the only one I can think of off the top of my head where both like guys got in at the same year like that. Yeah, dude. Um, there can't be there can't be all that many instances just because of how it times out or whatever and especially when they've changed it but you know it would be nice it would be nice to it's just that because of where their placement is and because of like i talked about before they're not american etc mm -hmm. it's probably unlikely to happen until the ballot thins out a little bit sure. um another kind of interesting non american potential vote who I don't think is going to be getting in at least not for a bit but interesting at least to talk about his resume is Ocelino Freitas um, definitely one of the better Brazilian fighters of all time a massively popular Brazilian fighter but resume wise not so sure he belongs I don't I can't say I've ever voted for Freitas before um and, you know, and it's different. It's interesting, too, because had he won one of those last fights, like had he beat Corrales or had he beat Juan Diaz near the end, that probably would have swayed a lot more people, especially the Corrales fight. You know what I mean? But for what he did, yeah, like <laughs> Freitas was one of those dudes when he first came on the scene, he was an anomaly. You know what I mean? Like no one really knew. You just read about him because this was like the infancy of like. Well, I mean, it was uh, the internet was already in full effect by the time he came in in the late two, like late nineties, early two thousands. I don't want to say that, like this was the beginning of the internet, but there was no, there was no such thing as streaming back then, right? Like there was no YouTube, there was no this, there was no that. Everything was still tape trading and just kind of word of mouth or reading reports and whatever, you know, the dark ages, as they say. And when I started reading about Freitas in the late nineties, especially when he was like, I think he joined the box, 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 Cino tournament. Um, yeah, the, uh, he was on some sort of, uh, 
uh, what do you call it? Like, yeah, the the that company that joined ESPN later. Yeah, Boxino. I think he was. I think he did that. But you were just reading. He was knocking dudes out left and right, like early too. You know what I mean? One round, one round, two rounds, one round. And it wasn't until he fought Anatoly, uh, Anatoly Alexandrov. I'm looking at his uh, fucking box rec right here to remember that. Alexandrov was a good fighter, man. One of those tough uh, Soviet Union dudes with the fucking Popeye chin that just was a rugged individual. And when he fought, I remember he fought um, Gennaro Hernandez on HBO and gave Hernandez fits and, you know, on his way to a loss. And for him to get absolutely knocked unconscious the way he did by Freitas, I think put everyone on the radar. I'm like, yo, who is this dude? Right. And so, yeah. and wow. then as it, and so it started as such, you know what I mean? It wasn't until he made his debut on HBO on the, uh, the ill-fated KO nation of all things too. You would think you'd be on, you know, like a boxing after dark car or something like that. Instead, he's on KO Nation. I don't remember watching the car, but I'm assuming he came out to like Ludacris or some shit. <laughs> and, because remember, they would just pick the most random music for fighters back then to walk out to on KO Nation. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. Th- that format would have worked a lot better now than then. But like, sure. you know. Yeah, I love it for what it was, though, man. I thought it was cool watching Saturday afternoon boxing. I think that they thought that people would actually stay home. When they don't realize that back in the early 2000s, people were still going to the mall and doing this and doing that on weekends, as opposed to staying in and watching some random dude from Brazil defend his belt against a Roy Jones buddy. But I mean, you know, it is what it is. But that was his first, like, that was his first um, fight in terms of, like, you know, U.S. exposure. Well, I remember um, I didn't see it yet because it took, like, a little while for it to make the rounds. But I remember after he stopped Alexandrov, he scored an, a quick knockout over Javier Hauregui because uh, yeah. I remember when I heard about that dude, Javier Hauregui had been in fights with like Agapito Sanchez. Like he'd given, he'd given a number of like upper level fighters. Hell, he just was a guy who like, he was never getting those decisions. He had, he had like, you know, a, a number of losses and almost all of them were by like close decision where he'd like, you know, he wasn't getting a rematch because that shit was like a two point fucking loss. Mm-hmm. And it was a, pain in the ass for the other fighter and they were like fuck that we're not you know we're moving on and that was the kind of fighter that Hauregi was for a number of years but then uh Freitas just scored it's it's on YouTube but Freitas scored just like a fucking like crunching fucking knockout over that fool and the thing about Freitas was like no matter win or lose that fool is going to be sobbing yeah no matter what that fool is going to be like (laughs) <laughs> Make of these fucking crazy fucking faces after he knocked a dude out and shit, dude. So I remember when I heard about him, I was like, oh, so there's this Brazilian fool who's just knocking guys left and right, bro. It was crazy. And that was how he was built, you know, coming into especially the bigger fight with Joel Casamayor. Yeah. And, you know, back then too, like you didn't know what Freitas could box like that or anything. We had just seen him knock the shit out of everybody. And in that fight, like, he was reserved. It wasn't a very exciting fight. It was a close fight. But, like, Freitas, you know, Casamayor is one of those guys. He's been on the ballot for a number of years, too. And he's one of those dudes that if you look at his record, you could see him on a lean year maybe again and again. But, like, a lot of decisions where he should have got it, he didn't. So that kind of hurts him. But, you know, and this is one of them. It was one of those fights that it was because Casamayor is such a fucking difficult guy to fight that if he lost, it was still going to be close and arguable. So, like... This was one of those two that, like, I don't, I have not watched it in years, so I can't even tell you who I remember thought one or something like that. But I remember it was just like some people thought it was justified, and other people thought that, like, Casimiro got robbed. I thought Casimiro won, and I haven't watched it in a while, but it was, at the very least, it was like really fascinating as far as the stylistic shit went because Casimiro was the dude, you know, he's the slick Cuban boxer, right? Sure. And then Freitas was the bomber, he was knocking everybody out. And then it was like, I, it was either first or second round. It was like the end of the first round, I believe. Casimir just like cracks him with a fucking southpaw left hand. And Freitas was like, fuck that, dude. And just started yeah, fucking right. boxing the entire way. And it was like, oh, that's weird. I thought he was supposed to be the boxer. And it totally flipped the script. And then uh, Casimir ate like a total bullshit knockdown. It was like a, a footing issue. It got counted as a knockdown. And then he got deducted a point for like, kind of like, he, it wasn't even like a hit. He like fucking like pushed him away or something like that on the break. And then he got deducted a point for hitting on the break. And that led to him losing the decision. It was like, bro, you know, it was, it was just weak how he wound up losing. And a lot of people thought he should have won that fight. But in any case, 
wound up not getting the fucking decision in that. Uh, but that also propelled Freitas forward. And what should have happened is they probably should have rematched, but that didn't wind up going. Thousand percent, man. That would have been, you know, and Casamayor probably would have won a rematch too, if you think about it. But like, there was a lot of discussion about Freitas eventually fighting Floyd Mayweather, as there was with Mayweather fighting anyone back then. And of course, none of those fights ever really happened. I mean, surprisingly, right? Boxing. But it's like, Freitas never fought Floyd. Um, who else was around back then? Well, there was, that was right around, uh, gosh, one thirty. So it would have been like, you know, John Brown would have been like, you know, toward the fucking end of his shit. But Steve Forbes had Steve just Forbes, kind of, yeah. he, I yeah. think, missed weight. So I think that he moved up to 135. And that was part of okay. the reason why he wasn't there. But like, um, oh, gosh, what's his name? Um, well, I mean, you could literally just pull up the ring rankings for the year. Sure, yeah, <laughs> Look yeah, at the lightweight yeah. division. But but in any I mean, case. Corrales was up there too, but they ended up catching up to each other a little later. It's yeah. like, Corrales, had, he, this was, ahead. sorry to interrupt you, but this was when he, Corrales would have still been either in prison or just getting out. Yeah, 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 yeah. But after, after that fight, like, that's when, you know, Freitas kind of became like a two fight or a, a two fight a year type dude because he was a massive star in Brazil and just kind of commanded that he was able to do that, you know what I mean? And his last really exciting win, I guess, would be over Jorge Barrios. That's a fight we talked about before on the show and how ridiculous that was. Just absurdly bloody, excellent scrap, one that just holds up, you know, stand the test of time. And Freitas showed his class in it, too, because, yeah, he had to revert back to his wild brawl in a little bit, but, like, the class of his, like, superior box and, you know, stole through when he was able to soft them. But when he fought Corrales... You know, that was one of those fights that, like I said, if he had won this fight, there's a good chance that I would be able to be like, all right, you know, I'll check Mark him for the hall because he looked really good in that fight too. You know, Corrales is one of those guys that we we love him to death because of the blood and guts that he showed and all that. But, you know, when it comes down to it, he was slow of foot. He was kind of a plotter. And he could be like hit, you know what I'm saying? And outboxed. He just had to be able to realize he was going to keep on coming and his chances are he's going to take your head off at one point. But it's like, he was, you know... Freitas had quicker legs than him, was already at that point, was not really a slugger anymore, was becoming more of like a mover. And he was doing what he did before Corrales eventually ran up. And Freitas, we found out too, if you really put it on him, he would break down. So Yeah, just spit out. His, he did that in like three different fights where he just yeah. spit out his mouthpiece like that too. And and he, uh, because of all the running, dude, it was like if you chased his ass down, he'd just be like, all right, I quit. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. No more. And I think one of the more surreal things was after the fight, after he got stopped, I want to say that like his cornerman still put him on his shoulders and he was waving his hands and parading around the ring like that. It was either that or the Juan Diaz fight. I forgot which one. <laughs> oh, man. And the, if I can, uh, he got a gift over Zahir Rahim, who, you know, oh, just God. pretty much everybody would just prefer to forget about poor guy, who was a very, very good fighter, but just maligned and awful to watch. A smoke gainer fucking type of. Just you know, that was, that was the first fight that was like bringing back the new boxing after dark. Like after it like went dormant for a few years, and I think it was like what was it, Fran they Charles? Like, Take it away. Take it yeah, back away. It was like what was it? it? Was Fran Charles and and who else was on the call for that? Probably back then. Was Brian Kenny on that back then? Maybe it might have been. Yeah, because that was when they brought it back. Yeah, I think. Yeah, when they brought it back, and that was just a fucking sign of things. That the uh, oh Lennox Lewis. Those yeah, yeah, three. I was gonna say Lennox was on it. Oh, God. So, yeah, that was a sign of things to, uh, to become because that was a horrendous main event. And that whole run of that era of boxing after dark just fucking sucked. All the fights sucked. All the main events sucked. Everything about it was just god-awful. So, rather not talk about it. But, I mean, for for Freitas, if there was, like, a, a couple of key wins he could have got there, yeah, I would have voted for him, you know? And then another dude, uh, one other guy I wanted to bring up, because we've each year we bring up Gilberto Ramon, you know what I mean? Each year we bring up Santos Lycia and the guys that we talked about, we voted for. So I don't really feel like we need to talk about that because literally go back to listen to past episodes. We discussed just, them. Just to know. reiterate that these are, if not the best fighters in their respective divisions of all time, yep. easily top two or three period ever of all time in that division. Why would that? What? What? Come on. What? And they've been forever. Like, Gilberto Roman, Roman, and we and voted Lucia, for them. Yes, have both been on the ballot 
since I've been for for the past 20 years that since I've been voting. Meaning like Ramon has been on since he was like standing, you know, with his shit right next to like Lusa Lika or any of those type of dudes from like way in the past. Like this is how long he's been on it. And unfortunately, because it's been so long, it's gonna have to take a very lean year for him to be able to get in. It's not gonna happen this year. And I can't see it happening any, you know, another year when they got more popular names always being added onto it because the average voter is just going to see that and not give a shit, you know, up to us. We've been talking about that for so long that I think other people too are like, you know, catch on and like, Oh yeah, he is a legit fighter. And then you got dudes like cliff rolled and others who are clearly, you know, very knowledgeable that know this and will vote accordingly. But again, there's like a ton of motherfuckers out there who just don't. So it is what it is. But one guy I always like was curious about that's been on the ballot for a number of years. Also, that some people like, oh, whatever, and other people are like, yeah, I'm surprised he's not as Meldrick Taylor. That's true, yeah. Meldrick Taylor's kind of fallen by the wayside on the ballot um, for a handful of reasons, even though he had a pretty accomplished professional career, but he definitely, anything he accomplished gets badly eclipsed by the losses he took to Julio Cesar Chavez, which sucks, obviously, because Chavez, extremely great fighter, losing to him is is no... You know, there's no shame in that, but Taylor's wins outside of that, they get a little bit thin. You know, he has a great amateur resume, but, um, you know, not a ton of high, high profile pro wins. Yeah. You know, it's one of those guys that like the same thing with Freitas, but even more so like the shot, if he wins the Chavez fight, he would have been in years ago, in my opinion, you know? Oh, that no was, question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's it's an entire discussion unto itself. There's absolutely no question he got fucked in that fight, but, you know, got fucked in life as far as his brain because of it, too. Ah, oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's awful, man. My, have we ever done a podcast just about that whole, about that fight? I don't Maybe think we have. I would. I mean, for the anniversary you know. next year or something, we'll come up with it. But oh man, that'd piss make every. No matter what, you're guaranteed to piss people off. No matter what. You know the thing about him is that like Meldrick Taylor, when he came up, the thing look, he was the one of the youngest members of that of the '84 Olympic team, right? I think he was 17 when he won the gold medal there, and the only person, the only U.S. Olympian, I want to say I might be wrong on this. I don't know. If, I don't. I don't remember the age of Fidel or Barbara when he won the gold, but I want to say the only U S Olympic gold medalist that was younger than Meldrick Taylor would have been, um, Jackie Fields, who was ended up becoming a fucking, what, um, what was he? Uh, welterweight champion. Welterweight. Yeah. Yeah. Welterweight champion. Yeah. It was like, when it was getting all funky with like young. Yeah. Jeff like Thompson the early, and, yeah. Like, then like, yeah, but like the late 19, you know, in the early, late, early, early yeah. 1920s and thirties, stuff like that early thirties, but that's a long fucking time. Think about that. You know what I mean? You got to do from like the twenties who became, I want to say Jackie Fields was like the 1920 Olympics or something around there. And then you got all the way to Melcher Taylor in the 84 and Taylor was the baby of the team, but he was so just like charismatic and like his style was more so fit for the pros. Flashy, and quick. Flashy, everything. Yeah. yeah quick. And he was a Philadelphia fighter, despite how quick and like, quick twitched he was and the reflexes he had he'd like nothing better than go into the fucking pocket and brawl with somebody like his hero joe frazier you know and to the detriment and like you know the headaches of george benton and i guess luke dufer to that matter because they would just be like Dude, what the fuck you don't need to do this stop going in there and taking two punches yeah but i like it you know but i mean buddy mcgart's a great win all right buddy mcgart's gotten into the hall of fame in the, over the past years and he got in as a fighter which i'm not sure i would agree with you know, if you if you add in his credentials as a trainer and everything else, then fine. I can see him getting in. I, I'm assuming that's what everyone kind of did, just kind of lumped it together. But like, that was that was a big one. You know, McGirt was 38 and one at that time, and like, you know, Taylor dazzled in that fight and stopped him in a big way. But like, still, no one was considering McGirt the the top fighter on the entire planet. By the late 80s, the junior welterweight division was like, you know, strong, but it was kind of like in a in a weird flux that, you know, they knew Chavez was coming up. Roger Mayweather was still champ and Buddy McGirt was at the helm. And you had other like leftovers like Joe Manley and, you know, other dudes around from back then. So it was kind of like a myth. But I mean, he beats Money McGirt, beats um, John Meekins and a couple, you know, and a few other dudes. But like, it's the Chavez fight. That's the main one. You know, it's rare to have two guys 
at that at that time in their absolute primes, both undefeated, both of them co champions, and looked upon as like you know either in the top five or the pound for pound, which probably Meldrick Taylor was at that time, or like the top ten, or Chavez consensusly being top one or top two. You know, Tyson had just yeah, Tyson had just got knocked out in February, so Chavez probably got hoisted up to that. You know what I mean? And Taylor deserved it. Taylor deserved it, in my opinion. So the the Aaron Davis win is a good win. The problem yes. with Aaron Davis is that outside of beating uh outside of beating um Mark Breland, Mark Breland he yeah. you know, his resume gets pretty thin too, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and those things do count, you know what I mean? Like it's a good win at a good time, but you have to consider who else is on that other fighter's resume? And there's not really a whole lot. And apart from the Chavez fight, you go around on Taylor's uh, resume and you, most of totally his right. other big fights he lost. Thousand percent, yeah. He lost, he got knocked out brutally by Terry Norris. Beat um, Craig Houck. <laughs> hey, I mean, listen, if you want to get into the Indiana Boxing Hall of Fame, then I guess that's a route, right? <laughs> that's that Maybe that is, maybe that's the path, you know? Bro, I saw a video of Craig Houck knocking down Camacho the other day, and that was insane. <laughs> hey, hey, bless him, dude. Craig does his motherfucking thing. That guy's that guy's hustling. He's like, about, man. I mean, listen, he's like he's you got said, his hustle going, bro. Whatever. I'm not gonna knock him, and he's one of those Midwest fighters that probably fought fucking I don't even know how many times those dudes were on the circuit. So God bless him. But anyways, like yeah, it, you know his two his two wins after the Chavez fight. And this is like, okay, that doesn't make for a Hall of Fame career. Like you said, Aaron Davis, and then he beats Glenwood Brown. And that's not, you know what I mean? That doesn't add up for that. It's almost it like, no. And, you know, his career completely hit the skids after that. He lost to Crisanto Espana. His last big fight was the Chavez loss in a rematch. That's name and, recognition, you know? Yeah, that's completely all that. And It's name recognition. So, I mean, I can see why he's still on it for a long time. I don't plan on ever voting for him, but it's like... He's there. Wilfredo Vasquez is another interesting name, too, that's been on the ballot for a number, a number of years. And a guy that's like, in for my opinion, highly underrated, you know. Sure, some of his biggest fights he did lose and he went on the skids a couple of times. But if you look at his body of work over the years, too, like, man, that guy is legit. You know, I mean, like, beat a number of former world champions, became a, a three division world champion. Um, when it was still kind of difficult to attain such thing. And he beat like really tough guys to become champions. It wasn't like knocking out cupcakes or anything like that. His last championship went against a Lori Rojas, another criminally underrated dude for the, when the, um, the WBA featherweight crown, I believe it was, was like as good as it gets. You know what I mean? Vasquez a lot smaller, older, getting out box thoroughly throughout the fight. And then when he exploded, I think it was like round 11. Without, like, wow. And then you see Mitch Halpern grab him. Yeah, well, dude. It's one That's more one time. of the wildest knockouts you'll see yeah. just because it's the timing of how it all worked. He steps in and it's like dude's already throwing as the referee steps in. Punch just goes right around him and it's like, bang. <laughs> That's a fucking uh, wild, yeah. When I watched it as a kid, when I watched it live, I initially thought that um, I initially thought that uh, Halpern had like chopped fucking what's uh, Rojas's head because like you said at the time. That's kind of what it looks like, yeah. Like they, it's, it's simultaneously that Halpern grabs him and Vasquez hits him, but Vasquez's arm is almost blocked by Halpern going like this. So it looks like Halpern is moving in and it's going boosh. And then, while he's taking him down, like, I'm sorry, bro, you gotta take this. It's gonna be, it'll be better than what the fist is about to hit you with instead. Yeah, for real. <laughs> but, um, you know, Vasquez is one of those guys for me, though. On a lean year, I can definitely see him getting in, but it's unfortunate because his credentials outweigh a lot of these guys, you know? It's just... He he knocks out... Um, So who was it? Like... His first... Lo um, He beat Raul Perez for a world champ, you know, to become champion, which was, like, a big, like... Obviously, Raul Perez is one of those dudes back then, too, another underrated guy who was a longtime champion at, like, you know, the um, junior featherweight and up to junior lightweight era, like, everything like that. Really good dude, man, you know. Um, Terry Jacob was another one. And when he finally lost, like, his biggest win, though, from that era, and too, no one ever talks about this anymore, is when he beat Orlando Canizales. Like, Canizales, another who got in his first time being on the ballot for the Hall of Fame, and understandably so, 
was the longest reigning um, or most defended uh, bantamweight champion, wasn't he? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, IBF champion and just defended like what was it like fourteen times or something like that. I think it might have gotten broken since then. I I know that we'll, uh, another dude we'll talk about Vir Virvol Sahabram. I think he might have uh, broken the okay. defense, but like. I don't remember exactly the number. I know that they're both up there, though. Point is that Kanizales was on that shit for a while. Yeah. And it wasn't just like, you know, Kanizales was feasting on absolute scrubs. Yeah, there was a few like ham and eggs here and there in that division. But like, if you watched him, dude was pure class. I mean, it's fucking footwork, everything he was doing, but like, absolutely incredible fighter. So for the fact that when he was moving up to fight Vasquez, I mean, Vasquez was looked upon as like, you know, a solid champion, but this is supposed to be like Kanizales' coronation to another division. And Vasquez shut that down like solidly. It was a close competitive fight, but one that Vasquez clearly won. And especially because this was also considered kind of like a second or even third leg of Vasquez's career. Because that first yeah. leg, it's like he had like five losses or something like that, where he just lost to a bunch of fighters, good fighters too. But it was like that's what he looked like. He looked like he was gonna be like a middling guy. And then all of a yeah. sudden it was like something snapped and he's he went on like a run. Yeah, and and he was just one of those competent dudes, bro. He didn't make a lot of attention, didn't, you know, be, do a big scene. He was a lower weight guy, so obviously his presence was going to be, like, a little bit more mellow than, like, say, a guy like Tito Trinidad or anything like that. But, dude, he was just so consistent throughout his career, man. Like, you know, anytime you saw the ring record, uh, this, um, the ring results, he was – and he was a world traveler, too. You got to give him credit for that. It wasn't like he just kind of hung out in Puerto Rico and just defended a bunch of times. He would go to Japan and beat up Japanese contenders and travel there, travel there. He didn't really give a fuck, you know? And just a solid-ass individual. But, like, his late career, too, like in the late 90s, when he should have been already wrapped up and already done, when he knocked out Aloy Rojas, that was – big like that was a big massive win which he was far behind on that and he went on a nice run up until you know 98 when he fought prince hamed so and since we're already on the subject of bantamweights another really interesting entry to the conversation of the hall of fame who is again going to be a guy who gets lost toward the middle because of uh lower weight non-american also didn't have a whole lot of uh, Americans on his resume, too. Unfortunately, that's Miguel Happy Laura, Colombian champion, who was very, very good champion. Um, and also, you know, a lot of Colombians kind of get the short end of the stick when it comes to credit uh, yeah. in, in, you know, boxing history. He was a good champion, defeated Daniel Zaragoza, defeated Alberto uh, Davila, and also went to war with Canizales. It was like a two or three round fight. but <laughs> It was oh, a fucking was war, bro. Yet. His brother, not Orlando, but uh, Gabby. Yeah, 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 yeah. The other Ken is all as, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the thing, the problem with Laura, unfortunately, and this, like, hurts him more than a lot of the other candidates, I guess maybe Samuel Serrano would fall into the same category, is that their primes literally ended when, if I'm looking at the ballot right here, like, their primes ended before, like, the modern, like, you know, before the modern cutoff, like, they were already basically done, essentially done by 1988. You know what I mean? Yep. So how many years is that now? 88, uh, that's 36 years, right? So yeah, So they're like in a real no man's land as far as memory. Yeah. You know what I mean? thousand percent. You know, you got guys like me, you, Lee, and a number of others. I know Lee, uh, Lee Rose was a big Laura fan and like talked about uh, him to me for a number of years and saying how he wanted him on the ballot before he ever got on it. But like, there's a, the whole generation of new voters and other stuff too. I'm just gonna yeah, look I at that. that I have no idea, other than saying, okay, it says happy, so that must seem like it's a cool name. And it's, but he had a really, he had a great run. You know, I know there was a little bit of controversy saying that like he was using like stimulants or some shit in his corner. Am I correct on that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yes, kind of. But like, so the it was actually funnier than that. Basically, okay. it was after, I think, one of the Davila fights. I think he fought Davila twice. He did, he um, fought him twice, yeah. And I, I want to say it was the first fight, but it's on his record. It's over there. But if you go look at it, uh, it was at the forum, I believe, and fucking between rounds, one of the officials said that they had suspected something or were tipped off and that they had tasted his water in the corner and that it tasted sugary. Okay, and and so he was accused of having sugar water instead of water in his corner, which was a big fucking thing, you know. Which is hilarious, especially yeah. now, you know, motherfuckers are on HGH and taking About fucking other things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who knows? 
fucking Osterine and shit. And they're talking about sugar water, which is also hilarious because another dude who was on the list, uh, who doesn't really qualify in my opinion for a motherfucking hall of fame, Bernardo Vargas was somebody who had, uh, argued to have Gatorade in his corner for a few fights successfully. And the commission had allowed them to have Gatorade instead of water and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, but um, yeah, so there was slight controversy. I want to say it was like 88 or some shit like that. But point being, yeah, I guess a, a bit of a precursor to the PED conversation yeah, sure. in, in boxing, even though it was not really yeah. PEDs. But yeah, Miguel Laura, one of the dudes who is at least interesting in this conversation, almost certainly will not get many votes at all, but no, deserves and, consideration. You know, he should. Like his run was brief but as littered with really good names too. Like you mentioned, Davila was a briefly um, Bantamweight champion after, you know, that tragic fight with Kiko, Kiko Bahinas. But like that dude literally had been around since like the late seventies up until the end of the eighties, which is like an incredible run when you think about it, considering most guys were burnt out in their late twenties at that lower weight division, especially back in the eighties and seventies and stuff. You know what I mean? So those are, two really good wins he wins the belt against daniel zaragoza who both of us both love and zaragoza has been in the hall of fame for a number of years his first defenses against wilfredo vasquez i mean right there back to back even though both guys weren't you know able work um went on to achieve more in their careers like think about that on your resume now you know what i mean and antonio avalar is another one avalar was a former champion in the early 80s who had also knocked out vasquez and had been in some incredible fights and this was like his last run, but still, he just crushed him. And, you know, up until the point where he finally lost to Raul Perez, that was basically it. So, like, when you look at his breath, at like, the, the whole stack of his of his resume, there are good wins right there, but it's just so brief that no one's ever going to vote for him. Uh, yeah, just another guy who falls towards the middle again. Yeah. And you brought up Sammy Serrano, uh, another guy who is a very good fighter, but the lack of uh, unification and also the timing, you know, just really bad timing for, uh, you know, there were a lot of stars at the time and he wasn't even the biggest Puerto Rican fighter of his time either. So that's, so that hurts him needless to say in the conversation, but his resume is a little bit thin too. He's got a couple of really good wins and a guy that we brought up on, uh, I think we brought him up on two shows um, when talking about African boxing and that's in Kasana. Yeah, Inkasana and Mikshaji, great fight um, and a back and forth fight. And also that was when Mikshaji was like kind of in in top form too. Yeah. And so that's considered a pretty good win, but he got absolutely fucking blasted against Yasutsune Uehara. Yeah, I mean, he avenged that loss, but like blasted, like a- all-time knockout status. What a, not to veer off course really quick, but what a random ass fight to put in Detroit. It wasn't that, that was on the undercard of, that was on the uh, undercard of Burns Cuevas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say that was on the, yeah, because that had two, that had a couple of, um, Hilmer Kenty, Young O, and then also, yeah. so those three fights in a row had like three kind of like wild stoppages where it's like, damn, that would have been yeah, a great card to be on. Yeah, Shapers was on that card too, but like, it's just funny the thing that Harold from- Smith, the promoter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> It's just a random fight because you guys like you would think that would either take place in Puerto Rico or Japan. Yeah. Which I think the rematch strange. did. I think the rematch took place in Japan, but like, yeah, that's of that's, all places. It's hardcore fan shit, bro. The hardcore fans in the joint would have been like, Yeah. I mean, it that that fight, that knockout did place on the VHS 30 great one punch knockouts. And if you watch it afterwards, Serrano was so blasted, like he lifts his head up and he's just going. Well, yeah, yeah, he got like mummified from that knockout. Yeah. He gets like into the ropes and is just like. And what's crazy too is that he was winning every second of that fight up until that time when he got knocked out. <laughs> yeah, dude, that was a wild time. Uh, a wild, probably like 10 years for Japanese bombers, bro. Just like dudes who came out of nowhere and had like a bunch of losses. But then if you slept for 10 seconds, they were fucking knocking you cold. Fucking crazy. And then it moved and then it moved on to um in the late eighties with the Korean fighters, where you just started like, you know, them dudes just dropping in there, not giving a fuck. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right, let's see if we can squeeze in some more before we get out yeah. of here. Cause I mean, there's some fighters who deserve to be t- we already talked about too. Uh when we well, went over the the here's the one I want to bring up with you. 
actually, because I don't think we've ever brought him up on the show, but he's been on the ballot for a number of years. He's been dead for a number of years, but everyone still, you know, remembers his name. I mean, like most boxing fans remember him from always being a classy champion. Others might remember him from being Floyd Mayweather's first title fight victim, but like Gennaro Hernandez. Yeah, dude. And he, uh, that just came up the other day too, because the anniversary of Mayweather Hernandez was just the yeah. other day. Oh, um, you know, that a lot of people also forget, and this is not, this is not an argument against him at all. Gennaro Hernandez, you know him better than me. Because you actually uh, worked around him when you were doing production. Uh, I, didn't, I you? didn't get to. No. Oh, I thought you did. No, well, my no, mistake. I just, yeah, I just missed out on him. I, by the time he got diagnosed with cancer, I think I was already out here, and then it went into remission. So I never. Oh, really okay, had... damn. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I got to hang out with him a handful of times, and literally like like maybe like three or four. Super nice dude. Extremely yeah. nice dude. Uh, you know, talkative would talk to you about damn near anything. If you like one of those fighters where if you asked him whatever about his career, he'd answer it and he wouldn't get mad or he wouldn't take sure. offense. Super nice dude. But a lot of people forget also um, when, when he wound up going out in that fight. And cause I think he had a broken nose. People were like quitter. He quit that he's never going to live this down type of shit. And, just like any time any fighter, you know, bows out of a fight between rounds or anything like that, they get branded with some stupid ass scarlet letter. But for a little bit there, that that was kind of the case. You know, and it's sad too, because like that was listen, there's getting there's quitting, as you want to say it, right? And there's like, you know, getting like a nose injury that's you kind of questionable where you're like, all right, you know, maybe you could have continued on. But no, Hernandez's nose was absolutely shattered. It was like the, the doctors confirmed it afterwards. Like, that thing was broken into, like, basically, if you take a glass and just throw it on the ground, that's what Hernandez's nose looked like. And apparently what happened was, the story was, is that Hernandez was sparring with Shane Mosley before the fight. And this is the most, you know, I wish more dudes back in the 90s would, like, realize sparring with Shane Mosley <laughs> was, like, a detriment to their careers. Because think about it. Shane Mosley breaks the nose of Gennaro Hernandez. He gives um, Zach Padilla a brain bleed, I believe it was, when they were sparring. And Padilla subsequently had to retire. He was a fucking menace back then. Anyways, Hernandez gets his nose. Yeah, he was like 15 or some shit, too. It's like fucking like... <laughs> beating the daylights out of dudes. But like, so Hernandez um had a subsequently, like I said, had a had a broken nose before the Del La Hoya fight, right? Or some damaged nose, whatever it was. And so he went in there, damaged goods, and that, you can't blame him for that, man. Oscar hit him with one shot, and like they said, like they said, the thing was completely shattered. He couldn't continue. Even if he wanted to, there was no way to, because like the shit was just gone. You know, it wasn't like a kink. Like, it was just whoosh, gone. And that was and, when Oscar was, like, kind of scary, too. Like, that was when oh, he was... Oh, yeah, man, you know. Five listen, foot 11 fucking lightweight. Bum equipment sponsored Oscar De La Hoya was an absolute maniac back in the day, man. Like, you know, just towering over these poor dudes and just sleeping fucking... Poor small guys like uh, Jorge Jorge Paez and, and Jesse James Leja, who look like they're a foot below him. You know what I mean? And he's just blasting them with their hook when they go skittling across the street. That's where Ryan Garcia got it from. Except yeah, obviously, no shit. yeah. But you know, Hernandez, to his credit, he shut the critics up because think about it. A few fights later, you know, in a year or two later, he fights Azuma Nelson, and Nelson's coming off of that nasty knockout of Gabe Ellis, and um. Everyone's excited about him. Oh, he was also coming off of the knockout of Leha, too. Like, he was beating the shit out of these dudes again. And what round? I don't remember what round it was, but, like, Hernandez was out boxing Nelson for the majority early on. But then they got into, like, a corner. It was, like, round seven, round eight or something. But Nelson hits him after the bell, I think it was, with a punch to the fucking throat. Like, just a nasty shot. Bow! Like, directly right in there. And... Hernandez, as any of us would, grabs himself and just drops, right? And um, the doctors, the referees, everyone gave him the option. They were like, yo, you can quit right now and we'll go either go to scorecards or you'll win by DQ or whatever it may be. And he said, nah, fuck it, I want to fight. So that should shut the fuck up for everybody right there at that point. You know what I mean? You can't question that. Because that's a nasty thing. Getting punched in the fucking throat. Bro, we saw what happened to Dwayne Bobbick when Ken Norton's Paul axed him in the throat right there, right? You saw his eyes almost bug out, his face just, like, contorting to a massive red welt. He couldn't even he... talk right for, like, months after that, dude. Like, he said, right. that, yeah, he, yeah, he said that his voice box, like, never fully recovered after that and shit. 
who are you talking about? Our Hernandez? Bobic. Or- Sorry, Bobic. Yeah. 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 And he did have a raspy voice. Yeah. Immediately yeah, they after- interviewed him afterwards. He was like, uh, 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 uh. Like, well, if you listen closely, when the referee is about to stop the fight, you hear Bobby go, I'm okay. I'm all right. Bro, clearly not. Your shit just got fucking throttled. But, I, you know, that's a nasty punch. You're not supposed to get punched in the throat. And Nelson hit him directly right there. And to his credit, he sat there, gathered himself up, and went on to win the decision. Like, stuff, as tough as it gets, man. But what would you say, though? Would you look at, if you look at his resume, would you think about still voting him in or... Uh, I mean, I probably not, dude, because similarly to some of the other dudes that we've talked about, he doesn't really have a whole lot of like signature wins, dude, his best wins. I mean, he has a couple of good wins, very good wins. Azuma Nelson toward the end of his career is a very, very good win. I'm not sure it's a great win, but it's pretty borderline. Jorge Paez, a very, very good win. Great win. Probably not. Considering, too, the Piaz win is in 95, and, like, Piaz was already looked upon as being washed by then, to the point where this fight wasn't, like, you got to remember this, too. Hernandez was the WBA champion. The WBA made this a non-title fight because Piaz wasn't ranked by them. Think about that now. Like, any fight now that any, they, they want to get their paws on it, so they'd be like, yeah, fuck it. Like, we want to sanction yeah. and we'll, we'll rank tips. They didn't, you know, but Piaz went on to still have some success. But, yeah, I agree with you, man. It was... It's almost like he's more popular for being a good guy as he was and one of the most genuine humans on the planet, apparently, in a, in a sport that rarely produces such good people like that. But I, I tend to agree with the intense why I haven't voted for him either is that, like, you know, it's just the the meat is not there on the resume lab when it need to be, you know? And he also, uh, you know, there might be people from Southern Cal- the Southern California boxing scene who don't like it and don't like me pointing it out. But it's true that he comes from the Hernandez family, which is a really big boxing family in Southern California and has some pull because of that. And so, you know, right or wrong, um, I think that he gets a little bit of extra consideration because of the family that he comes from. And the fact that he was big and popular in the Southern California area, a lot of people forget about that going into the De La Hoya fight. That was part of the fucking promotion was that like Southern California or Southern California type Huge. shit. And so, you know, that was a big angle. Uh, but regardless, that's not an accomplishment in, of, in and of itself. So if we're talking pure accomplishments, probably yeah. not, dude. You know, probably not. Um, let's see. And I guess the the only other guys that I really wanted to bring up and wanted to kind of jam in there before we before if there's anybody else you want to talk about is I simply wanted to bring up three together. I guess it's not very fair because again, anti US bias, but Vera Pul Saha Pram, who I mentioned earlier, Pong Cyclic Wan Chung Cam, and Ratanapul uh, Sorvorapin, three very, very good fighters, but all three of them. Uh, all three of them also Muay Thai practitioners who deserve consideration, not for Hall of Fame, but deserve consideration as fighters and martial artists because of that. But all three of them also suffered from being kind of like, you know, a number of Thai fighters, isolationists, as you should, yeah. as you could possibly say it, where they often fight only in Thailand or close to Thailand, don't necessarily stray too far from a certain kind of roster of opponents and but all of them suffer because of that. Wanjong Cam obviously has the most longevity of all three. Saha Prom, good longevity, but not guys that we're going to see in the Hall of Fame anytime soon. No, and if you're going to look, if you're going to, if you put all three of them together, easily the one out of the three where you can just throw out and be like, I'm, he's just there because of his longevity, but literally nothing else is um, Sorvorpin. You know, right in the Paul Sorvorpin was a part of the strawweight division in the early 90s that Ricardo Lopez dominated. But the thing is, even though Lopez was the face, name, and I guess star, if you want to call it, of that division back then, so Vorpin was putting up similar numbers as Lopez. You know what I mean? He just was doing it more low-key because he was staying strictly in Thailand from doing it. But he was knocking out every... I mean, if you read the magazines and were going by the Joel Koizomi write-ups, he was seemed like he was every other month he was like knocking off another dude who you never heard of, but that's the problem is that he was raking up these, these wins, but he's doing it against guys that are just kind of like, you know, and especially in the strawweight division of the nineties where the, like the competition was so thin back then and, you know, trying to find really tough rank content. Don't get me wrong. They were very good fighters 
in that division. But Ricardo Lopez was the one that was fighting them as opposed to a guy like Sorvora, you know what I mean? Like, Carlo, Ricardo Lopez was the guy that was fighting Rocky Lane, or he was fighting Carmen, Gu- Carmen Guardia, or, um, you know, those type of guys, like, back then, you know what I mean? Uh, and, um, Andy Tabanis, or, I don't know, I'm just throwing names out of my ass right now, the guys that I remember he fighting, right? Or obviously, uh, Rosendo Alvarez, right? Um, or or um, uh, Neem San- uh, Alex Sanchez. Nini Sanchez, right? You know, Nene. But it's like, those were legit fighters. And Lopez was the one beating, beating the shit out of those guys up. You know, um, so Horopin was building his record up. And I mean, blasting dudes left and right. But by the time he ended up losing his belt to Zolani Patello in the late 90s, remember him, the, the, the tall, elongated South African dude? Yep. Like, then, you know, his bubble was kind of bursting. He moves up to junior. He moved up to junior flyweight or a flyweight, I think it was. Lost to Will Brisby immediately, and like his first fight in America, he lost him to lost him in Minnesota. I don't remember how I remember this shit either. No, such a nerd. <laughs> he lost to Will Brisby, and then you saw him fight Lopez. Remember, it was like a, it was he fought Lopez either at MSG or or in Vegas, but it was Lopez's second to last 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 fight, and this was when. Don King brought Lopez to HBO. Like Lopez never fought on HBO. He fought on HBO pay per view. Yeah, and he's such a he was on Showtime for that entire time. I remember the first time when he appears on HBO pay per view when it was against Sor Borpin, and you can hear like the, in the HBO announcers almost giddy that they get to like you know announce a Lopez fight for the first time because like sure it's fucking pure class and Lopez is in the twilight of his career too. This is like around two thousand two thousand one, and you know it's like it's. He's, he's older now and everything and like you can see like his hair is thinning and all that but like bro he's still like, three rounds he just beats the absolute daylights out of sort of him. so out of those out of the three easily i didn't mean to go on about that but like he's the easiest one to like chuck out he's literally there because kind of like Svenaki or gregorian for that matter it's just that he was champion gianfranco rossi it was just that he was champion forever and racked up a bajillion defenses yeah, he has the thinnest resume of them all. At least, you know, the numbers are there, but when you peel back a layer or two, there's not much yeah. to it. Um, you know, Saha Prom at least had wins over guys like Adon Vargas, uh, you know, mm-hmm. um, Nishioka, uh, Joishiro Tatsuyoki, a number of fighters who were either former world champions or world champions when he defeated them. So he's at least got, you know, the longevity plus a handful of names. But you know, and he had the, the comeback factor too. Because yep, you got to yep. remember early on, like he was. Uh, did he break the record for like shortest amount of world title, shortest amount of fights before a world title? Because he was only like two or three and oh when he became champion. I I want to say there was another fighter who fought in their second pro fight or something or maybe third. But regardless, he was up there. He's obviously yeah. up there. You know. So he won that fight like literally like a third or fourth pro fight or something, right? But. He got knocked out by Nana Kanadu, like after a defense or two, like early on. And uh, apparently, yeah, I've never seen it, but I heard it was an exciting fight. Kanadu got dropped. He got up, dropped. And Kanadu is a hell of a fighter, too. He doesn't get talked about enough. But yeah, he another awkward kind of lanky dude. And like, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these Thailand fighters, they kind of fall off the radar after they like lose, right? Remember, for instance, like Sarah Mongol, Sarmang, Samangasak or some Sigmanksak, shit? Samangasak, yeah. Then in Tatsuyoshi, knock him out. And then you didn't hear from him for a minute. And all of a sudden, he resurfaced after a number of years. And you're like, wait a minute, his record is stacked again. Kind of like what happened with um with with uh Saharpa. So he did that. And then by the time he fights Tatsuyoshi, who was a long was I wouldn't say a long time champion, but an extremely popular fighter in Japan, on par with the Torogati in popularity. And this was like his twilight career of his career too, because he came back. I forgot who he beat in an upset to win the belt. Uh, Tatsuyoshi, that is. But he also, but he was also coming off a big one against Pali Ayala, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Robin so, like, Alves. Yeah. Hmm? Victor Robin Alves. Yeah, yeah. And he also beat um, Pali Ayala in a title defense, which was like, you know, Ayala was undefeated, and that like gave him, you know, some momentum. But like Saha Prom knocked the shit out of him like, twice. Like viciously, you know, and finished his career and ended, and then became a long reigning champion after that, much longer than he did his initial reign to give him the credentials. Like you said, the guys that he beat, like Adam Vargas, who again, that's not going to put you in the Hall of Fame, but Vargas was a hot fighter during the time that was getting a lot of attention. 
And so he beats him comprehensively. He beats uh, Toshi. What, um, what did you say, Toshiaki? Yeah. T- well, he defeated uh, uh, Joichiro Tatsuyoshi and then Nishioka. Nishioka, that's right. Yeah. Nishioka is the dude that was long enough, was around long enough that he fought Donair, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so. he became like a Japanese boxing legend and shit. Yeah, yeah. Basically. So, I mean, his credentials are there. Like, if you really think about it, I mean, I don't know if I would like vote for him considering other names and all that, but like, he's a guy exactly. that like, he belongs on the ballot. Yeah. And, and Wan Zhang Kim probably has the stronger credentials, but there's a little bit of a smoke and mirror with that too, unfortunately, because I, I liked Wan Zhang Kim a lot when he was around. Yeah. He was one of the first fighters, I've mentioned this before, that when we first started getting footage of, like, uh, Asian fighters that, like, we only ever heard about, that was one of the first yeah. fighters that was like, oh, shit, he's fucking good. He's, he's <laughs> fucking, he punches hard, he fucking fights hard, he's crazy. Yeah. And I remember watching him being like, hell yeah, I'm a root for this dude. And he was around for a long time, but, dude, there were a lot of opportunities to unify, even though the WBC flyweight title uh, also carried with it the lineal title for years and years and years. uh, He never unified, even though there were ample opportunities to do so. And on top of that, he kind of played the mandatory game. He had a lot of non-title fights, kind of stayed busy with uh, non-title fights and shit. So, I mean... you know, I, I wouldn't mind seeing him get in, but just not over the other names, kind of like you were just saying. Totally, totally. But those are, like, good ones to bring up, too, you know what I mean? And, you know, I look at the ballot again, and I'm just looking at certain guys. Like, we've discussed Michael Nunn. And I think, I guess that's one I'll bring up, too, like, maybe my last one, because I'll, I'll, be able to, I'll be able to segue this into guys that should be on the ballot, if you see where I'm going with this, right? So, Michael Nunn, I think we both voted for him when he first appeared on the ballot. I think so, yeah. Like, it was yeah. a pretty thin year, to be honest. So. But none was one of those dudes that, like, again, I was kind of surprised that it took so long to get for him to get on, too. And, you know, if you look at his complete resume, well, his resume is actually a lot better than a lot of other guys. The problem was is that, like, he pettered out quickly, and people just have a bad perception of... They remember his losses, then they, then they do his wins. You know what I mean? Aside from the Sambu Kalame fight. Because... When Nunn came up, um, he just narrowly missed out on the 84 team. I think he lost out to Frank Tate, right? But as he turns pro and, you know, he does his thing, eventually he gets up and he fights Tate in a rematch from their amateur days. And, and Tate was the was the undefeated IBF um, bantamweight champion. The first one after the Hagler era, right? After Hagler lost him. Bantam, bantamweight? I was like, wait a second. Oh, no, no, I said uh, middleweight. Middleweight. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wait a second. Bantam, you got me confused. Yeah, yeah. Middleweight. Yeah, yeah. Middleweight. After, after after Hagler yeah, yeah. lost them. Yeah, middleweight. Yeah, so, and and Tate was Tate was popular. Yeah, I mean, he was an '84 Olympian and a good fighter, you know. Or I wouldn't say popular. I guess pushed, promoted well, promoted well. Let's put it that that's, way. Yeah. That's a, that's why that's better to put it promoted well. Absolutely. And none decimated them in their in their fight. You know, what I mean, broke them down, stopped them, and looked really good. He not he destroyed um uh Juan Roldan who was still serviceable at that point stopped him and then um the way he knocked out fucking Sumbu Kalambe was just incredible because like we've discussed before that fight so that's that was one of the big fights man and this is the thing is that like Kalambe and it, it appalls me that he's not on the Hall of Fame ballot all right because this dude, as legit as he was, man, this was like a supreme boxer. And if you look at his resume, too, like, he doesn't have a ton, a ton of names on it. But the names he has, you just be like, wait, what the fuck? You know what I mean? He beat Harold Graham twice. Now, Harold Graham never became a world champion. But that dude probably should have been a world, would have been a world champion almost any other era. Absolute menace to fight. Everyone avoided him. And Callum May beat him twice. The second time after he got knocked out by none, he was already kind of past it. So think about that. Like, legit right there, you know? He arguably uh, got robbed against Ayub Coyote in one of his earlier losses. Lost an early decision to Dwayne Thomas in America, which well, it's not a bad deal. Dwayne Thomas is an underrated fighter and a good fighter in himself. And probably coming to America for the first time and dealing with whatever. I'm, I'm sure, you know, things happen, whatever. Right? So you can write that off. But during his run, he beats Iran Barkley for the, for the vacant title that Hagler, you know, that Leonard um, vacated after he beat Hagler. And that's a good win. I mean, that's a solid win, especially too, because like Barkley was in his prime and you know about to unleash his hell on everybody. And he 
beats him comprehensively. But the fight that like really solidifies him on everything is his first fucking, you know, his first defense against Mike McCallum. Like, this is prime Mike McCallum, undefeated junior middleweight champion, knocked the shit out of Donald Curry, considered one of the best fighters in the world, a guy that's heavily avoided by anybody. And Callum may put on one of the best displays of boxing of the entire decade. You know, if you watch it, people that listen to this show, I've probably have seen the fight, but like, just go back and watch it, watch highlights or whatever. It's an incredibly fucking just beautiful fight to watch between two like great practitioners. And Callum gets the better of it. Like it's extremely close fight, but he definitely won that fight. It wasn't like no bias because they were fighting in his home, you know, adopted country or whatever. Callum Bay beat him. And he beat him. He beat um Steve Collins, who we mentioned before. Um, he ended up beating uh Robbie Sims and Doug Duet before he finally ran back into um uh um Michael Nunn. So back to that fight after this. And so that's why I'm like, why is he not on the ballot? How is he not on? When he has wins over legit Hall of Famers and other former champions and stuff like that. And you got all these cats on, but, you know, there we are. So you got none to come back on this shit. And none knocked the shit out of him, man. No one expected that. Really, they really expected to be like a tactical battle. And he just walked in with a perfect punch and got him. And it's like, from there, I think everyone just assumed that he was going to be a superstar and he was going to produce all that. So when he fought Iran Barkley next, instead of showing his true style of like, you know, hit and not be hit, kind of gangly, this and that, and uh, it turned off everyone because it was not a good fight. It was an awful fight. And Barkley arguably kind of beat him in that one. But it's like that the wheels started spinning off. I mean, he was still successful, successful and still winning. But the public perception changed so much that he almost became like public enemy number one. Yeah. And the style change up, especially after that early start was wild and did not make him any fans really. But he also, it sounded like at least behind the scenes started getting into a little bit of trouble and issues training and stuff like that too. But when you take all that into consideration, especially in the fact that he got, you know, knocked silly by James Tony. Um, and then he still came back to win a title at super middleweight, defended a bunch of times and actually against a bunch of names. The only real issue with his run before that is that a number of the middleweights that he fought were like former welterweights who had moved up and stuff like that. And so that's kind of like, you know, that's not, doesn't look great on his part, but they were still names and they were still good fighters when he fought them too. So it's not like, you know, he just doesn't get credit for the wins. So yeah, he probably should. And he deserves consideration too, like a number of these other dudes. Yeah, and, you know it's unfortunate for none because, like, look at after after he gets knocked out by James Tony, you know his his career did hit the skids a little bit, but he beat Murky Sosa too. Like he lost to Steve Little, which is I don't I don't even know how that still happened, but um, the thing is after. He moved up, right? And so, like, his career never really recovered after losing the belt to Steve Little because he never became champion again. But his light heavyweight run is actually, you know, a little, like, underrated, too. Like, he went in there in the, in the mid-'90s. He was defeating a number of dudes from the stupid middleweight to light heavyweight. And he became the number one contender to fight Roy Jones at one point, like, mandatory challenger. And his last big win before, you know, he got in trouble and things started happening to him was uh, he fought William Guthrie, who was like, you know, a recently deposed IBF champion and a guy that thought that Roy was going to, you know, do this and that too, and fucking destroyed him, like blasted the hell out of him and knocked him senseless, you know, really beat him up and dominated him. So, yeah, almost, almost became a three division world champion over Roshiani too. Yeah. You know, and that's a whole other story too, man. My man Roshiani, we should do a, uh, like a mini podcast one day on the life of Roshiani. That guy, that guy had a wild time, man. From the fight, bankrupt the WBC. I'm saying, (laughs) do you remember, bro? After when, like, he said, "Fuck that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sue them." That Antonio Tarver came out and was like, "I'll let you fight for the belt if you want it." (laughs) He was like, "Don't bankrupt us." He was like, "I'll give you a title shot." (laughs) (laughs) And the dude was like, "Okay, cool. I'm like almost fifty. I don't need your title fight. I just want my money." (laughs) Yeah, he's like, "I got fucked like twelve years ago, bro. I just want some money." (laughs) Rest in peace. I think he passed away, didn't he? He did. He passed away in like 2017, 2018, something like that. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, man. He, yeah, well, and he got hit by a car too. That's what it was. That's what. That's right. That's right. He's riding his bike, I think. Wow. Um, fucking fighters getting hit by cars. If before we dip, is there anyone else that either you wanted to mention or someone that you thought that we should like should be on? 
you know, about- shout out. No, not necessarily, but I was going to say shout out to Gwen Gemini. She should she should be getting in on the women's ballot. Gwen you know, Gemini. Gwen Gemini. You want to elaborate about it? Like well, I mean, uh, she was one of the fighters uh, right around the exact same time. Well, as as I'm not even talk- familiar with her, so. Well, um, sh- so right around the t- in the mid seventies, I I won't go too too far into it because it's it's probably its own podcast to be honest. But in the mid seventies, uh, seventy five, seventy six, when there were a bunch of women coming around trying to get licensed. Uh, obviously, Marianne Trimiar was one of the one of the main ones. She just got inducted a few years ago. Jackie mm-hmm. Tonawanda, far more controversial entry into the Women's Boxing <laughs> Hall of Fame as a as a uh, not a non participant but a pioneer. Um, Deservedly, so fuck it. I don't give a fuck what anybody's trying to say. She clearly was a pioneer on the in women's boxing and deserves to be in. For that, but Gwen Gemini was one of the women who was actively fighting and had a bunch of, you know, actual uh, verified fights. If people are getting all pissy about that, but um, she fought in some of the first sanctioned women's fights in a number of different fucking states. Gwen Gemini, that is, she held wins over. Uh, I think I want to say she beat Marion Trimiar once. I believe, but she beat Sue Fox. Everybody happy about that one? <laughs> no, but uh, she basically, she was fighting right alongside a number of these women in the mid-70s and early 80s and deserves the exact same recognition and credit right alongside them uh, sure. when it when it comes to, you know... Uh, Tiger. Yeah. Go ahead. Tiger Trimier at the Hall of Fame. She got inducted... A part of that giant class that was supposed to be like 20, 2020, 21, and 22. Mm-hmm. I want to say, uh, was that it? You know, whenever they did it, right? Well, they kind of like combined everything together. Yeah, I think so. I think, they, I think they, yeah, everything came together in 22, right? That's when they first had that, that another induction. So, and she was there, bro, and she was so happy, man. That was a beautiful thing to see. She was so happy. Like, she was in a wheelchair and all that, and, you know, she's kind of frail and shit, but like, she was just hyped, just there to she talk. She seemed to like she was happy, and it's good like, to see her get recognition for sure. Took absolutely. a long time. You know what I mean? Like she's one of the few pioneers that are still alive and being able to make an appearance like that, and just you know to see the glow on her face to know that she was being recognized for the shit that she did, and like she was a legit fighter. I mean, we can do a whole podcast, which we probably should one day, on the on the underbellies of the women's fight scene of the seventies and eighties, and one hundred percent. The, the the bullshit that they had to go through to get like you know the basic just the most basic rights and um yeah. you and know she had a career for that and shirley tucker uh, was another one who probably should be getting in and i don't know if she will she probably won't get in over cat davis i'll talk about that in just a second i'll try to squish it up as much as possible but don't get me uh, mad, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People going on about Jackie Tonawanda, but don't got nothing to say about Cat Davis. I wonder why that is. Anyway, Shirley Tucker uh, was undefeated, but as with a number of the women right around this time, the opposition level not very good. She fought a number of women making their debut, etc. So I mean, it's kind of dodgy with the undefeated thing. But when it comes to Cat Davis, Cat Davis is the first woman to be featured on the cover of ring magazine. If you've ever seen that 19 early, uh, I think it's early 1977 ring magazine with her on the cover. That's the one that, you know, that's the woman. And the problem is that that feature in the ring magazine, she has a big write up, big spread written about her. It's written by a dude named Sal Algieri. Sal Algieri was her fucking manager. So uh, Nat Lube, Lubet, however his name's pronounced, actually allowed this chick's manager to write a big ass story about his fighter and publish it in the ring. And then on top of that, to expand on this, Sal Algieri was later, I don't even know if it would happen in court. I think it did. I'd have to double check. But he was later, uh, they later figured out that he was completely manufacturing records Cat Davis's record was like half fucking fake. Uh, And he is also making up rankings. 
because he created this women's boxing fucking ranking thing during the 1970s and just completely made shit up, made up records, et cetera, et cetera, was like making up names, having women fight under fake names and shit like that. And that was the dude that they allowed to do a big spread and article in the ring. And that's who they got on. That's who they have on the ballot. And that's who's probably going to get in over these other women. So and I want, I want to hear y'all fucking raising hell about that one. Funnily enough, as you mentioned, the timing of when that article came out, that was around the same time Don King's U.S. tournament had completely imploded, which Ring Magazine backed with their rankings. So, yeah, Ring Magazine was in shambles mm. back in the 70s. If you're thinking about how they are today, just remember this has been like, you know, over 50 years of absolute bullshit with them. So, <laughs> yeah, the, the beat goes uh, on, bro. Yeah, right. Shout out to the whispers. And, um, well, well, that's yeah. I agree with all those too. And like, you know, if we want to like branch off to the to the other ones too, like I hope another guy like Guy Dollings, who we brought up before on the show, gets in finally, or um, you know, the first person that influenced Ray Arcel to get into the gym and like, you know, help him become a trainer. I know he's been on the ballot for a number of years, and I'm not sure how many people in that you know, was it the Observer category that they're on. Uh yeah, I think so. Like that, yeah. Where like you know, could do their due diligence to, to put them in there. And then there's just just a number of others. You know, when it comes to fighters, like we mentioned, at least on the modern ballot, you know, you got to – it's just so many guys, that it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, John Conti, I forgot, like, he'd be on the old-timers ballot. I'm surprised he's not on the old-timers ballot. You know, he's a guy that's been omitted for a number of years. Whether Especially or not with how popular he was in the U.K. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I know his last fight was, like, what, 1983 or something, so he'd be more of the modern old-timers, but – he deserves to get at least a shot on there. I'm shocked that Marvin Johnson's not on the normal modern ballot. Um, first three time light heavyweight champion. Look at the guys that he beat, you know, that he fought throughout. Great fighter. Yeah, absolute great fighter. And the one dude who lasted longer than any of the other light heavyweights from that era in terms of just being there. You know what I mean? He was the, and think about it too, he was one of the early ones. Like him and. Eddie Mustafa Muhammad and a couple of other ones, like those were like the, the early dudes who started that whole golden era of light heavyweights. And by the time it ended in 1986, when he got stopped by Leslie Stewart in that rematch for 87, whatever it was, he was basically the last one standing over there. Michael Spinks had moved up to heavyweight, but you know, aside from him, think about it. You know, Yaki Lopez was gone. Saad Muhammad was completely wasted at that point. Um, Victor Galendez, God rest his soul, had died back in 1980, and Marvin Johnson knocked him out for the belt. Um, you know, the the beat goes on. Like you said, the list, there was a bunch of those dudes and Marvin Johnson was still the last dude out there. So it's like, well, how has he not been on the ballot or anything? You know what I mean? Get your shit together, Canastota. Just, and you know what gets my, grinds my gears too, is that like, I've talked to people about this. Like I mentioned earlier on the show, I'm one of the few people that does that. It's not a part of the BWAA that got voting privileges. So Don Majeski was the one that put me onto the Hall of Fame. You know, I met him when I was 19. And through a collector named John Gay. And um, John was like, yo, you got to meet this kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, Aris, tell him about the Coco kid. So I just broke it down. And then Don invited me and my dad to dinner that night. We were like talking about a bunch of shit. And Don Majeski's had an incredible career, man. Listening to him tell me his stories was pretty wild. But like, it all it all culminated with him. He was like, yo, you're going to vote. Don't worry about it. People might question me because you're a kid, but like, he was like, just give me your address. You'll get a ballot in the mail um, that month, which I did. So that started my 20-year journey of voting. But anyways, what I'm saying is that over the years, I've been talking to him, you know, whenever I see him, because now that I live out in New York, I see him at fights or whatever. Maybe whenever I run into him and you know, we have a chance to chat for like, you know, a minute or two, we inevitably, it comes up sometimes like about who should be on the ballot, who's not on the ballot, who should be on it, you know, whatever. And I've told him over the years, well, I'm like, you know, why isn't Simon Brown on it? And whatever reason, why isn't this dude on it? Why isn't that dude on it? And I'm trying to like, we never really had a chance to like sit down and like really discuss like why so like why certain people are on it and why other ones are not on it. But like, it's just, I need to know the process of that because like it just, a lot of it doesn't make sense to me, you know? Like some guys, I know the Hall of Fame through the grapevine was trying to put certain names on it to try to bring more popularity if they get inducted into the week into the hall of fame weekend i get it you need like you know people that will bring in noise or whatever but like what about the dudes who just deserve to be in because they need to be in like what are we doing here 
Exactly. That's my question. What the fuck are we doing here? And I mean, you know, I guess it doesn't really matter to me whether or not anybody who's like, you know, making decisions sees this or watches it, fucking hears it. I don't care. They could kick me off or whatever the fuck they want to kick me off. But I don't even know how many like more of these votes I have in me. Not because it's like some long, arduous process or I'm some like persecuted person or something. I'm not. But it's just that it doesn't really make sense to me. Like a lot of what's going on doesn't really make sense. The facility is dying. The organization does not seem like it's in very good shape. You know, I, I don't know exactly what we're doing here. <laughs> like, because for me, speaking directly what you were just talking about, if for me, it's it makes a lot more sense to honor the older fighters who like don't have much time left, who do like you know, sure. deserve that recognition now, not a couple of years from now. Cause we got to get fucking Sean Porter in, you know, like, come on, bro. I'm not trying to get Lucian Boutte in. We need to get, you know, these fighters who are 50, 55 years old and haven't fought in a bit and are barely remembered. We need to get them recognition. So I don't know. Yeah. It's, we'll it's see crazy. how long I like, fucking last. Perfect actually. example. Perfect example. Years before I ever became a voter or you, for example, you know, Luis Rodriguez. Luis Rodriguez, for years and years and years, I guess, was on the Hall of Fame ballot and was never getting in. And people were like, Hank Kaplan, everybody was signing in and be like, what the fuck? Like, why is this man not in yet, right? And also saying, too, like, like you do realize he's sick. He has, like, liver cancer. Like, we got to, you know, we're going to do something. Do it. He ends up passing away, and then he gets in immediately after that. You know? It just doesn't make sense to me. That's yeah. that's my issue. Is that what what we're doing here is I'm not really sure I understand. Sure, and but, I don't. And I wish the best for Canisota. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, because like yeah, I, it's not personal. Grew up. I practically, and I want to see it work, man. Because like that's it's a beautiful place for boxing fans to come together for a weekend and just not only hang out with your heroes and shit, but just like you know come together as fans and whatever. And it's like. It's just so much has been taken away from it that it just like, you know, it's hard to really get that same feeling. You know, other places are picking up the slack. Thank God you got the AC Boxer Hall of Fame that looked like it was yeah, fucking that shit was off the fucking chain. Yeah, you know, it looked really <laughs> good, right? You saw all those former champions hanging out, all them dudes reminiscing, and they actually have activities to do there, it seems, right? Like, <laughs> they have a set, you know, uh, list and activities and blah, blah blah and a schedule and all this crap i don't i don't know man i'm proud to be a voter i'm proud that i made it to 20 years for voting don't you know what i'm saying but like at the same time i'm in the same boat as you i just need to see a lot of changes yeah, man. there's not a lot of enthusiasm really for it yeah. well in any case you know that's what this show's for so that we help kind of fucking break down for people uh, you know, some of the names that they might not know, some of the names that they might know, but might have looked at a little differently, et cetera. And that's just our view. Uh, but hopefully everybody who tuned in, whether they listened or watched, enjoyed, learned a little something more, you know, yeah. maybe not, maybe just had, had fun. But if you did go ahead and listen in through the podcast apps, subscribe, leave a rating. If you watched on YouTube, same subscribe, leave a comment. As far as social media goes, my boy, Eris Pina, he's, we're around. We'll have the little links and whatnot on the screen. I'm also there, but the Knuckles and Gloves podcast, that's what you need to go look for and follow and whatnot. But Eris, we'll talk soon, bro. Have a good one, y'all.